Okay, I've started a new recording. This is the second chunk of the March video chat with viewers. This is gonna be the normal chunk. I just had a 20 minute sec segment about talking about just the crew and the movement for the, to stop games from being destroyed and how we're gonna be doing stuff with, diff with various governments, that sort of thing, and looking for volunteer help. That's in the video before this, not this one. So if you're watching this on YouTube, that's about that. This is just gonna be the normal questions from the audience, talking about whatever. So th this one isn't that important. So if you're watching this. Uh, okay, what about the crew questions here? Uh, let's see, this is from Mr. Glanit. Well, we, Mr. Glanit's one of the people talking to me. He's one of the volunteers, so. Uh, Let's see. I mean, if there's burning crew questions, you can ask them and I'll answer it later. I don't think there's anything really important that left out in the in that portion, but so yeah, th this one's uh Yeah, th 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 this one's a little unusual. Oh yeah, I guess that's another thing I, I forgot. If I really need to, I might have extra streams either this month or next one. Um <clears throat> I'm hopefully covering everything, but just in case, you know. Freeman's mind three when, well, well, three, there's not really going to be a three unless there's a half-life three, but I, I know what you mean. Next episode. I'm not till late, not till after April 2nd, at least. Uh, although I'd rather get another game dungeon out next and this, and the easier side video. I, I think I voiced months ago and it's basically ready to go except for editing, and I was gonna get help on that one, so. That'll probably be next. So, let's see. In the Twitch chat, the chance to ask their questions, not everyone is volunteering. Well, that, that's what they did the At Ross broadcast, and well, there was, um, well, somebody asked a big one, why do you think the Crew Series is an exception for Ubisoft? That, that's a question, like, it's not an important question, like, as in, is this going to be what makes sure we're ready on April 2nd? That's what I mean by important. That That's more of like a general discussion question. Uh, is an exception for Ubisoft? I think they're just, I think it's like a boiling frog thing, you know, where they've cut. So Ubisoft has ended games of multiplayer before. I mean, they've ended the multiplayer portion before and they've ended like some DLC access. So they didn't, they've done smaller baby baby steps to this or like, I think it was that Might and Magic game where it was like a car, it was like more of a mobile game or stuff like that. So they've sort of dipped their toe into this, but this is the first big one. So I think I think we're just kind of seeing the boiling frog metaphor to answer that question. Um, why do you often announce which video is next? Some videos are seasonal. If you mention the next video being the seasonal specific video, it makes me not really feel the vibe of the video I watched. Oh, uh, well, I don't know. It just gives people something to look forward to. And I'm, and I'm usually excited about, like, you know, telling you that another one's coming because my mo I'm already working on it, that sort of thing. But that that gets me in trouble, though, when I'm not ready for that one or things come up, though. I, I, admit, I admit I've dropped the ball on that. So, But, yeah, th this is going to be on YouTube for, for the past video. Uh, for the, the actual people turning, tuning in live probably aren't the bulk. Yeah. Like for example, a lot of Australians might be asleep right now. So it's, uh, it's not necessarily, you know, the bulk of people who are, who need to know that. So yeah. Yeah. So, sorry, live people. You're, you're unfortunately the, not the priority of this stuff, but, or if you are, it's a coincidence, you know? Okay, yeah, as they're saying in Australia, it's 5.30 a.m. right now, so. Yeah, it's, uh, it's just, so a lot of the people that can help us may not be watching this right now, but they'll be watching it, like, tomorrow or something like that. Okay, so as you get to the regular questions, I try to keep it concise for the crew. Uh, oh, there's a crew Discord gathering internet traffic for the game and asking people to contribute. Just drop a DLL in the folder and send the log when you're... Oh, yeah, okay, so that's for the 
the effort to get it working, you know, the hard way, you, you know, well, not that what I'm doing is easy, but the, you know, the, the genius way. <laughs> They're doing it the, the genius coder way. I'm doing it the stubborn jackass way. <laughs> so involving government. Uh, so, yeah, I mean, fingers crossed on them, though. I will say it's okay if you don't have it ready come April. In fact, I think that might be better just, I mean, not that we can really control it on our end, but if they're listening, that, that would be awesome if it was like a few months after we do all this movement, you know, so it's like in late summer or fall or later. If they, because, yeah, of course I want the crew working again, but if all this paperwork is already underway and then the courts are looking into this, you know, it, then it's kind of too late to kind of kick the stool, then to kind of take the wind out of our sails on this because it's all it's it's all underway and they can't really take it back at that point. So let's see. Okay, well, people are asking a lot of other random life questions. I, I'll get to those at the end. Uh, they're asking if I have a game concept ideas I'd love to see get made. Yeah, maybe, but there's it's the sort of thing I have to stop and think about, and some of the game concepts I'm most interested in might be very difficult to pull off. So, Look, I, I have a pretty big backlog of games I want to play, so I, I feel like, you know, well, okay, I, I guess an easy one will be a, a Dungeon Siege successor. I mean, it seems like there's almost... People have mentioned Kenshi, but besides that, I don't know of any, or at least I've forgotten them, you know. Real-time action RPG that involves a squad. Yeah, so squad-based action RPG. It's like there's nothing. And that, that kind of that really surprises me, actually, because I would think that would be a pretty sellable concept. Because, I mean, Dungeon Siege kind of has its cult following, and you know, as long as you get the budget in line, that would keep it. Do you think Serious Sam 2... Not saying counter will make a good game dungeon. Yeah, it might. That's definitely a candidate for a game dungeon. Okay, so I'm going to go to the questions that people submitted and voted on, then I'll get to the live ones afterwards. Uh, let's see. What's your opinion on the recent news with Warner Brothers uh, retiring, in quotes, Adult Swim games and also refusing to give back one of the games to a developer who still has ownership of it? I don't know all the details on it, though if the developer still has ownership of it and they're refusing to give it back, I, I, I wonder, like, well, what's the issue then? Like, what, I mean, I, mean, I guess it's like a legal hang-up or something? I, or, or does he really have ownership of it? Like, he might have, yeah, this goes back to the EULA crap and contracts where maybe he has physical ownership of it, but he doesn't have legal ownership of it. I, I, I don't know. But... Yeah, I guess I don't know a lot of the details. Like they're, it sounds like they're delisting them, even though the developer wants to keep, you know, having them out. Um, sometimes there are gonna be reasons for that, but probably not in this case because, well, maybe if there, I guess if there's like an Adult Swim licensing issue, because I'm thinking with like a lot of car games, if they have, like you know, licenses from car brands, then that expires, then they delist the game. I mean, I still think it's a joke. And the industry, like if the industry was doing things in a sane way, they'd just say, fine, and your car's not in our game. I mean, it's just stupid because if, or, or you, you could uh, only have it like percentage wise or something. Because if you're still selling copies of the game, well, then if the car manufacturer gets their cut, however tiny, then what's the problem? You know, I just don't get it. And it's not like you own the car license for the next game if you're making a car game sequel. But Okay, so I'm getting off track. Um, yeah, it's really stupid, and it's... But it's the sort of thing where... Oh, boy, I might have to sneeze. Oh, wow, it's like on the border. It's the sort of thing where... Uh, you know, what the company is doing to make good business sense goes directly against literally what everyone else involved wants. And it, it kind of, it's kind of like what I discovered in the previous video about the EULAs being practically law. 
in uh, in the USA. The it in that uh, I had a train of thought and I lost it. It's practically. And that, yeah, we're, we're kind of letting companies do whatever they want. And this is the result. Because I was thinking about it. You know, the problem there is that the government, like in the United States, has said that essentially that we're going to remain really hands off unless we're absolutely forced to. So we're kind of seeing what company rule looks like. And it's horrendous for games. I mean, it, it's... It, so it's almost like they're begging to have rules uh, on this. Yeah. Oh, yeah. That's actually something I. Okay. Well, that's a little off topic. Um, but yeah. No, I, I don't know. Has the game has the Warner Brother games been uh, removed from users? As in, like, are users still allowed to like keep their copy of the game, or is it just? I was going to say, have they either made it a dead game or uh, attempted dead game? Where what I would call an attempted dead game would be there's no longer any legal way to retain the game, but people have pirated it, and that's literally the only way to play it. So, uh, let's see. They're, they're not even delisting yet. It's a rumor at the moment. Okay, so, well, if they let people... I will say the the government petitions I'm working on will still not protect against this scenario, but they would ensure that anyone who bought those games would get to keep them. Now, if these are completely free games, that would be another thing all together. Probably not if Warner Brothers involved. But uh, actually, my proposals would not protect against those. So if you're making a 100% free game, all our proposals have nothing to do with you because, you know, you're not taking people's money. And it seems kind of like it's overstepping a bit and putting obligations on you if you don't want them. And if you're not taking any money for it, then it wouldn't, uh, I don't see how it would be a problem. But I mean, or those are going to be the idea of somebody making an online only 100% free game and then shutting it down with nobody with no way to play it, it's going to be a very rare scenario, I think. I mean, it may be possible, but usually those involve money if they're online only. Usually completely free games, yeah, they want you to play the game, and they tend to release, uh, you know, either offline copies or ones that have, if it's online, you know, you can have your own server, that sort of thing. So besides if any of these measures pass, I think it's going to cause a, a change in the industry, uh, you know, and kind of they'll have some splash over to other sections. So I was saying, you mean like flash games from the 2000s? Yeah, well, see, those are different because, or mostly different, because a lot of those flash games, they were never really at risk. As in, if you back them up and then you have a machine you can run flash on, like on a virtual machine or something or legacy software, well, then you can still play them. It's only the ones that require that required you to connect to the online server that were at risk. And the vast majority of them, it's just nobody bothered, except I think there was a huge movement to back up all of these Flash games. So the, the Flash games, I think, were example of a mostly success story, from my understanding. So Okay, so let's answer more questions. If you got teleported to armed and to the armed and delirious world, and you knew for sure that you can't come back, what would your what would be your course of action? Well, I mean, a survival, of course. At first, I would try to get a food and water source and establish some uh, establish some shelter. From there, it would be it, it would be confusing about what to do next because I realized in the game, you know, Granny has her flying washer machine. I may or may not have transport to the other kind of mini worlds or not. So I might be stuck on the planet I'm on, which could be problematic for some of them. Uh, but yeah, I guess transportation would be a big deal to try and see if I can figure out a way to get to these other planets. I mean, it could be as simple as just like, like getting like a giant spring because you can breathe in space in that game. 
So I can maybe just get like a giant springboard to escape the planet's gravitational pull. But then I'd really have to aim it right. So I might, what I might want is like a, like some series of like hooks and ropes to try to grapple onto the planet that I can catch it, catch on to. Or, or maybe I can make like a balloon or something like hot air. That sort of, that, that might be doable with enough supplies. Um, hot air balloon. But yeah, if, if all, I guess I would try to have, I, I mean, it's not, it depends on the planet whether like work to pay for goods and food would even be a thing or not. And if it's not, I could try to like scavenge a worst case scenario. It seems like a lot, of, it seems like you'd get away with a lot of crime in Arm and Delirious. So if I had to, you know, I could just try to mug people to get food, but that would be like the last resort. Uh, but yeah. And then if there was anyone sane, I would try to, you know, make friends with anyone that seemed halfway sane. But, and if not, if everyone's just completely crazy, then I guess I would just deal with the crazy tour and just still try to explore everything and, you know, get an idea of what the, what that universe is like. I, I would prefer to have some level of sanity, you, you know, talking to people. There might have been some sane characters. I can't remember off the top of my head of ones you like have a normal conversation with, even if they're like some weird life form, you know. But yeah, it, it, it's, it's more crazy than I would want in my life on average. But, you know, I, I could cope with that level of crazy. So, Okay, next question. This week we got the news that Rooster Teeth would be meeting the same unfortunate fate as Machinima. Well, Machinima, I'm not even sure how unfortunate it was. The, the only unfortunate part of Machinima was the lack of notice so people couldn't back up a lot of the videos. Uh, but saying, did I personally have any fondness or connection with it? Uh, not directly. I mean, I, I do enjoy the old red versus blue videos. I I only saw like the first couple seasons. It went on a lot longer than I saw. I, I saw a few kind of random videos they had too, like the they did they did one for Supreme Commander that was good, where they're calling in this like surrender bot, and it's like the the giant, it's like the largest walking unit in the game. It, it, it was yeah. They also had a they also had some spoof videos for Fear the game. Those are okay. Uh, there, there was another one where I forget his last name, Gus. Th they were doing like a spoof on the Apple ads you know, for the Macintosh, and th they were talking about how you know how, how gaming on the PC is so complicated. You have all these specs and requirements, all these different games, and so they're saying, but uh, but gaming on the Mac is a lot of easier. It's a lot easier to choose the games because there's six. <laughs> or something. He was just exaggerating. You're just talking about how, like, he's basically saying that Mac is was not a great platform for gaming. Uh, I'm, I'm, it's better since then, but it's still nothing compared to PC. Uh, let's see. Oh, yeah, I also saw, that later on, they did a, I guess they got funding for a TV series that I saw. It, it wasn't bad. Uh, I mean, it was it was called Day 5. And the premise of it was that some phenomena has occurred where everyone who goes to sleep dies. So every character is sleep deprived and trying their best to find out how to survive and see if they can reverse this or do whatever. And so it's kind of like a mystery sci-fi thing. It's a little uneven. Like I'd say, like I'd say the plot is good and a lot of scenes are good, but like if it was... There's a lot of filler too, and the filler is not that great always. So it's kind of like half good, half stuff. I stuff I would skip, but it, it was interesting. Uh, and I, I like sci-fi stuff, especially with like unusual premises like that. But yeah, I mean, I never knew anyone involved. Uh, yeah, yeah. I think there was a Penny Arcade comic again with the Gus guy, where he apparently at some convention he got drunk and was trying to fight anybody who, who would fight him or something in a, according to penny arcade comic testimony uh but 
Yeah, no, I like small group comedy stuff like that. It's And there's, yeah, did it inspire, like, civil protection? Yes, Red versus Blue was an inspiration for civil protection. It made, I mean, I wasn't trying to copy it, but it made me think, like, yeah, I kind of like this format where you just, he's in the game and having conversations, and, like, y you could fit in a lot of good writing that way with, like, less production value. But I guess the problem is I got too ambitious with what I was doing with civil protection, so that, that got rid of all the time advantages, but... Uh, let's see. Okay, what else? But yeah, I'm I'm not an expert on the red ver uh, no. Again, I probably yeah. If, in fact, yeah, that was I just remembered that was one of my inspirations for civil protection in another way because I told you I watched a few seasons of Red versus Blue, and what I found was. They were having less comedy and more like having these kind of intricate plot lines and maybe taking some parts more ser more serious. And I was thinking, no, nah, I don't have that. Just go back to the fun comedy. That's what I was thinking. Yeah, that's what I want for Soul Protection. Like, I, I just want to stick with the fun comedy part. Like, I, I, w I mean, you can still have adventure and stuff, but it, it's like I wouldn't have gotten into the realm of like taking things more seriously and uh, just I, I would just want to keep it all fun, and uh, so yeah, that that kind of made me want to like s go back to the tone of like the really early Red versus Blue, which is all just kind of like casual fun stuff, which I, and that's the part I liked, you know. So let's see. Okay, so yeah, but but yeah, I, I just now remembered that 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 was an inspiration for me not to go in that direction because. I'd rather just stick to fun. <laughs> so, I have zero aspirations to make like more dramatic videos. I, I, again, no, I'm fine with having adventure and action. Yeah, that that could all be great. That that, but I mean, I'd rather just stick to like fun comedy stuff. So, uh, okay, let's see. Oh, yeah, I, I like this because somebody's saying they started playing the crew last week and they thought the the map of the states was pretty skewed with lots of inaccuracies. Well, it, it's sort of a representational thing. It, it's not like one-to-one -one accurate. It's like a miniaturization sort of like representational imagining of the states is the way I'd describe it. Uh, did, it did it bother you and you couldn't find it? But you couldn't find a place for it in the video, or the map problems never mattered at all. And then somebody, and see, I didn't remember this, but somebody says he did mention the inaccuracies with the border climates crossing over into areas that they shouldn't. Uh, yeah, yeah, his approximation, and he noted that. Rewatch it. And they're saying, oh, okay. So it, it's like both, both people on the internet saying, I said this, and saying, no, he said that, and I don't remember. <laughs> so. I mean, there's some things I do remember clearly when I make the videos. Other things, it's like, did I say that? Uh, maybe, <laughs> you know. Like, like what I definitely remember was I, I didn't like the transition from, like, broad daylight to just immediately raining in the span of, like, 20 seconds, you know. And I, I felt like that kind of detracted from it and sort of took me out of the game. Whereas if... Yeah, you know, like if you space that transition out over the span of like ten minutes or something, where the clouds would slowly move in, that would probably feel better. But yeah, I, and I remember, I definitely remember talking about like the lighting issues. How sometimes it's great, other times it's awful. So that's actually been a challenge for recording crew footage for those news videos. And I was thinking, okay, what direction can I go that this won't look terrible while I'm recording it? And we'll just look okay, you know. Because, yeah, if we get an offline copy, that would be – and can mod it. That will increase the enjoyment of the game for me significantly because there's a lot of mods that game needs. Like with better headlights at night and tweaking the lighting during the day and being able to, like, slow the time cycle so or, or control the weather. That, that would help the, that game a lot. And some of those could just be simple number values, but you can't do that with an online-only game. So, okay. 
this is another, okay, the chat can try to correct me. This is another situation where I do not know the details. Uh, because again, guys, I've just been so busy on this organization. Like it's just taken up almost all my time. Uh, like I, I, not every day, but I found for a few days straight from the time I wake up, uh, from the time I'm like, okay, I'm done. I can't do more of this counting exercise and counting eating. So I am taking breaks for exercise in the middle of that and eating. I was basically going, I've basically been doing like 14 hour days on this, trying to organize it because there's so many little components I have to keep track of. Now it's eased up a little bit lately. Once I set up the discord and a lot more people could talk to each other to organize without having to go through me, that, that took some of the load off, but there's still a lot to do. So I haven't been keeping track of a lot of the news, just kind of glance, a glance at it. But, uh, the, what they're saying oh yeah so what's your take on the entire yuzu nintendo situation also on emulation in general okay so my understanding is y yuzu is an emulator for the switch i think and they uh they had charges pressed against them by nintendo but they settled an agreement to take it down but i think they also agreed to pay 2.4 million and that made me think, okay, so my knee-jerk response to this, so I'm saying, where's the Discord? Well, the Discord's for volunteers only. Like, I, I don't want the, ran the random crowds in there. Sorry, guys. Like, so if, you, if you're focused on this and want to help, you can get access to the Discord. But, you know, it's, you, you got to be semi-focused for the Discord access. Uh, but, uh, yeah, you can email me about it. But yeah, for the Yuzu Nintendo situation, okay, my knee-jerk response is emulate reverse emulation. I mean, re reverse engineering of em to make create emulators is legal. That's what Sony versus Bleem was about. And so, if it was me, I would just well, okay, yeah, okay. So if their if their settlement includes two point four million dollars. And their initial charges were $24 million. If that was me, I would fight it all the way because it may as well be the same thing. That's more money than I'm ever going to be able to pay. So I might as well try to defend myself. Even if, like, even if I can't afford a lawyer, even though I, even if I was the creator of it and put an SOS, I think I could get probably some level of representation. But say I couldn't. Okay, fine. Then I'll just do my best to research the basic proceedings and just keep quoting so just keep referring to Sony versus Bleem. No, it's legal. This this court case says it's legal. And then just try my best to fumble around in court because I have nothing to lose. I'm like, "Oh, I only owe 2.4 million instead of 24 million. Whatever, I'm never going to pay it off anyway. <laughs> I might as well just try to fight it fight it all the way." So that makes me think either they were really intimidated because I've seen people back down on like, like for example, on YouTube, I've seen people back down on copyright claims from big entities like, hey, the BBC, they came after me with twice. And I successfully fought them off both times because I'm thinking, no, what I did here is fair use. I'm talking specifically about it, showing a real short clip for you know demonstrative purposes. This is fair use. I'm gonna fight it all the way. I did, and I called their bluff on it, so it never went to court. But maybe some people would be too intimidated to do that. But again, me personally, I think I would find a lot of courage for 2.4 million on the line. Uh, so, uh, let's see. That made me think that, okay, maybe they screwed up somehow and either had some elements that were not reverse engineering and actually part of a leak or something, in which case, oh yeah, they might be in big trouble. Or there's some other law I know about where let's say they were promoting piracy left and right. And when you can, like publicly, like with commentary and everything, and maybe that combined with making the emulator leads to actionable charges. I don't know. Uh, okay, somebody's saying yes. 
or, or they might be answering another question. But okay, so if if somebody in the chat knows, do like an at Ross broadcast, and you can correct me. Uh, because if neither of those are present, then I don't know what's going on. Because again, if you have if your settlement includes owing millions of dollars, again, if you just reversed engineered an emulator and released it. That's what Sony versus Bleem was about, and that you have, th that's protected under law. So, okay, there, it's not about them promoting Tears of the Kingdom ROMs being used on their emulator. Yeah, see, maybe if you're promoting piracy, then that combined with the emulator takes you into different territory. So I guess the moral of this story is if you're, if you're creating an emulator, you need to act like a robot and keep your mouth shut except for technical details, you know? And don't say anything, anything that can be construed as piracy. So that, that would be my advice. Or they were promoting support for the new Zelda before it came out. They're promoting it big time in their subreddit. So I guess, yeah, just keep your mouth shut. Let somebody else who wants to talk about it talk about it. <laughs> and so that you're never on the hook. That would be my... Uh, that would be my advice if if that is the case or if it's the sort of thing where yeah maybe, maybe again I don't know enough of the law to know that if you combine that with promoting piracy then you then they can't come after you for civil charge again I guess they can if they're willing to settle for 2.4 million so uh, but yeah you just have to like shut up about it <laughs> I guess just, just, yeah, I'm thinking like in Dragnet, you know, one of the catchphrases was just the facts, ma'am. You know, just stick to just the facts about your emulator and keep the, keep your discussion technical. And I guess learn from this and that what you can and cannot say if you make a future emulator. And they're asking, what's, what are my thoughts on emulation in general? I mean, I think it's, I mean, I think it's fantastic and it's necessary for preservation because, you know, over time, you know, the, I, mean, I mean, how many people have like an Atari 2600 working right now? I mean, yeah, probably some people watching this, maybe a few of you do, but majority don't. And they're only going to get rarer over time or for other old, other old consoles and that sort of thing because they're tied to the physical uh, the, the physical devices where if you have emulation, then you could get, you know, 99% of the experience if depending how good the emulator is and anybody can access it kind of indefinitely. So I, I think emulation is fantastic. I, I think it's great, but yeah, like if you're actually making it just, you know, d dot your I's and cross your T's for what you're liable for. But But, but, and then it could be that maybe just saying, yeah, guys, you should pirate games. Again, I'm speaking hypothetically here. You should pirate games. Uh, maybe just saying that isn't that actionable if they were actually go to court and be able to defend it. Uh, and this is just Nintendo kind of bullying them because they know they can't afford to defend it. Um, I mean, maybe, so I, I don't know. But, yeah, th this, this is not my realm of expertise. But, yeah, that, that's that's what I would say safely is don't use leak code if you're releasing an em emulator publicly and just keep your mouth shut of piracy. And I still think it's game on for emulation. But th th that's what I would learn from it. But, yeah, by all means, watch. I'm, I'm sure there's lawyer ch channels all over this. So... Okay, more question, but yeah, I'm I'm in favor of emulation. <laughs> you know, it's it's you know when people ask like, what are my thoughts on all this? You know, it's really not that simple. I like pe I like people being able to play games, and yes, I'm in favor of developers getting compensated. But if it goes to insane levels, especially if it's not even about compensation, then it gets kind of messed up. Now in this case. Yeah, it probably was being facilitated for piracy, but what did Nintendo have? What, what are Nintendo's uh, 
what their their end of life policy isn't the best for their old games. Like my understanding is, there's a lot of Nintendo games you can't get legally unless you're getting like the actual old like NES cartridges or something. Yeah, like say I wanted to play a Virtual Boy game today, could I do that on modern Nintendo devices? Like I doubt it. So they're doing a crappy job on preservation. So in my eyes, that makes the need for emulators like mandatory, you know? I mean, in a sane world, obviously not legally. Legally, as we're finding out, we have, in the United States, we, we have basically no rights when it comes to games. So, uh, but yeah, I mean, yeah, in fact, I've actually had the thought that, hey, maybe a Virtual Boy emulator might be pretty neat now with the advent of VR, where we have a, a really good headset to go with it. Uh, you might breathe some new life into those games. But, yeah, I mean, I want people to be able to play games from any time era that they're interested in. And I'm a gr and but I'm also in favor of companies taking, like, reasonable measures to prevent piracy. It's just that the industry is so irresponsible about it when it comes time to end support. So the, it, it's like th there's no reasonableness at all at, at play most of the, most of the time. Obviously, there's some good developers out there that, uh, that do the right thing. But, yeah, I, w I wouldn't put Nintendo on that list, you, you know, so... Let's see. Yeah, and, and Nintendo's notorious for going after fan games, too. I mean, that's that's the other thing. I mean, me personally, I think anybody should be allowed to make a fan game if it's not for profit, you, you know, or just, you know, free. I mean, it, yeah, if you're capitalizing off of it, then you're kind of entreading on their copyright. But, I mean, copyright's kind of a mess anyway. It, th that's the thing. Even these measures I'm doing, I'm keeping the scope extremely narrow. I am not trying to reform the industry with what I'm doing. I am just trying to stop them from destroying your games that you paid for. Or so it's that, that's literally it. And, and trying to because that's just such a bare minimum requirement, even though they're gonna make a big fuss about it. Yeah, in fact, if I, you can email me about this, too. If you have ideas of good analogies as talking points, when I'm coming, because I try not to use ones involving safety because it's not that serious, but one, one that keeps coming to mind is how the auto manufacturers you initially used to fight requiring seatbelts in cars. And yeah, a seatbelt, it is an additional cost, but it doesn't have to be that big a cost, you, you know? And I think that's not the worst analogy to requiring, uh, you know, customers to retain their to retain their copy of the game once support ends. Uh, I I, I want to say there were, there might be or, or another good analogy if you can find them. My memory is so blurry on this. It might be seatbelts, but I remember there's some really juicy quotes from industry saying. This is totally impractical and we can't do this about something that's like totally common, co commonplace now. If there's any good industry quotes about that, that might be useful for me to know when talking about games as a service. When showing that like the industry will say anything. I mean, we know they can do this. It's just they, they're choosing not to. And then doubling down on that to make it even more difficult to backtrack and that sort of thing. So. Uh, let's see. The okay, some more questions. Uh, what are your go-to setups for storage drives? And they're saying are all SSD anymore, and still some hard drives lying around for general use? No, uh, external versus internal drives, both. What data transfer read write speeds are you typically looking for? For hard drives, I don't really care. That tends to, I mean. I put like this, I don't even know what my transfer speeds on the drives I have in my system right now are. For, for hard drives, I tend to aim more for noise. So I, I try to go for quieter drives for hard drives because if I'm using the hard drive, speed nowadays is not my priority for that. If I want speed, that's gonna be on the SSD. Uh, are flash 
I think flash drives for quick transportation and what kinds of files. Yeah, I mean, let's see, I have some right now. In fact, they look alike, so I have like, I started, and you can't really read it. I have like, I got stickers and put like A, B, C to kind of give, keep track. It can be all kinds of stuff. This is, that's been more for experimentation for some stuff I was doing on legacy operating systems and Linux for a future video I was trying to do, but it's gotten sidetracked by all this other game campaign crap. Um, or, or sometimes we're transferring files to my wife or her computer downstairs where, like we tried networking it, but I, I it was probably my, put it like this, it might've been my incompetence or it could have just been some Microsoft protocol that was giving me a lot of trouble, but our speeds were not that great on networking. I was thinking, this is kind of a hassle. It's just going to be easier to do USB drives. And we, we don't need to transfer files like all the time. So, uh, but yeah, okay. So for storage inside my current system, I, it's not necessary, but I've, I've had donations of smaller drives. So I'm just using them. I have three SSDs that are not that big. One of them's a terabyte. One of them is, I think, around, it's either 320 or 250 uh, gigabytes. I think that was my system drive. And then I have, an, and then I have another one for, uh, oh no, shoot, I have four now. Uh, because one of them's an NVMe drive. The others are, are, are uh, SATA. I, I have two, I think, that are like around 250 gigs or something like that just for like games and extra file program files installs. I try to keep my system drive as small as possible because if I need to like flash or not, not flash, if I need to just wipe the system drive for some reason or, you know, do a, uh, do a system restore from a backup image. I want to be, I want to have that be as painless as possible. Like I try to keep almost nothing important other than that's required on my system drive. So like if there's save file, well, some of the save files, I'll leave them on there because I'm not expecting them to die like that, but import. Okay, so that's for SSDs. For hard drives, I have one, geez, I don't even remember how big it is. Okay, I have one four terabyte drive, which I use as kind of like a scratch disk for big files. And then, and then I have two, it's okay. Okay, I, I have okay. So I have three four terabyte drives. Although two of them are redundant, it's it's not technically a mirror RAID. It's um, I I found I had less hiccups. Actually, actually something from Windows that used oh what's it called? I, I think it's like a Windows. Oh God, what's the name of it? There's an old system Microsoft had for mirroring your drive through software. That one was kind of unstable, but then there's a newer one they had that that one's been very stable for me. Um, I forget, I'm just forgetting the names entirely. Maybe if I bring up disk manager, it'll... Yeah, I haven't had to mess with it in a long time. But the the mirror, oh, what is it? It might be drive spaces, but I, I forget. Yeah, sorry, I, I just really forget what it's called. I'm, I'm sure there's an IT person that, no, Terracopy software. I, I use Terracopy for stuff I really wanna be sure copies, but other than that, I don't really mess with it. Um, what? Well, anyway, the, the point is, it's it's essentially a software mirror RAID array, so that if one drive were to just die from a hardware failure, the other one should be safe. Uh, I don't use that for long-term storage. What I, that's sort of like an intermediary backup where for like, like for long-term storage, I use redundant like external drives that are powered off most of the time. But if I don't have like time, but that's usually, those are usually organized files. So if I don't have time to mess with that, I, or if it's just like kind of a short-term backup thing, I, I'm putting it on the mirror RAID array. So, um, uh, well, I mean, it doesn't protect you against everything, but it protects me against stuff I'm likely to... It, 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 I think in theory, it should protect me against uh, mechanical failure of one of the drives, which is the main thing I'm concerned about. Obviously, you could have a virus wipe it out or uh, like ransomware or something like that, but... 
it's so yeah and then i have a bunch of external hard drives that i, I move in and out i have like a yeah was it directly attached storage for that that's powered off most of the time but i i have honestly i'm not in trying to be a hoarder of hard drives it's just i've gotten more over the time some donated and they just keep not going bad <laughs> so and the long-term stuff I, I store redundant so i'm basically so if one drive i could throw one drive out the window and still have all my files but if one drive dies then or, or starts giving me problems then i it gets sort of marked off for not using that anymore but I, i'm doing I'm, I'm doing basically maximum amount a maximum amount of space for the cheapest amount of money essentially but and still having some level of backup. So, let's see. Yeah, somebody's saying, ever considered a NAS? No, I mean, a, a NAS doesn't really, I don't have need for it because 99% of the time, I don't need these drives powered on and then that's just more power and files and stuff I don't need and have something always running. So yeah, DAS is what I have. So, let's see. Uh, Okay, so, so I'm going to get to more questions here. Have you or do you keep a diary or journal? No, I mean, I, I think in elementary school, maybe middle school, that was like a requirement for like something or another. So I did it for that. Other than that, no, I don't really mess with that. It's just I, I keep notes of things I – I keep notes of things I don't want to forget – but that's not like, how did my day go? That's like, okay, I want this website location because it has information on stereoscopic 3D and I need to come back to this later. Or st So yeah, I, I keep a list of all kinds of things, but not how my day went or my thoughts. No, I don't mess with that. I mean, it, it, all, all the information I'm keeping is for some sort of purpose, really. I mean, the purpose could just be entertainment. Like, oh, this show seems really funny. I don't want to remember. I don't want to forget the name of it. So I'll put that down. So it can be for just not important things, but you know, it's all purposeful. Not, not, I, I don't care what my past thoughts were. <laughs> uh, let's see. Or, or rather if, if I care about my past thoughts, I'm going to have them in the present too, for the most part. <laughs> uh, what are your thoughts on the person who made an AI-generated game dungeon attempting to impersonate parody you? Somebody gave a link to it and the link's down. So I guess they they got maybe they flew a little too close to the sun for what they were copying and people sent complaints or they decided to take it down. I I don't I didn't even know about that. Uh the the people commenting on it saying it maybe wasn't that good. Whatever. It, it's I, the, the way I look at it is as long as you're not just like wholesale copying large chunks of the videos with nothing added to it, then like I, I'm not, I don't really care. It's fine. I mean, and even then you could have long chunks if you just wanted to talk over it or just have reactions or something. I, I don't know if my, my videos are the best for that sort of thing, but if somebody wanted to do it, it's not a problem. The, the, uh, point is, you can do – I'm, I'm going to have very liberal views on fair use for how you use my videos. So if you want to take samples from it or for something else or do a remix of it in some way that this is something unique and not you're not really directly competing with just me putting my own videos on the channel – by, by competing, I mean competing with my own footage, you know. Uh, then that's fine. You know, I, I think the only time I ever really did takedowns was the time that Russian game channel gave copyright claims against me after uploading copies of Freeman's mind on their channel. So again, I, I saw them like a mad dog. I had to put them down because it's like, okay, you know, I was willing to look the other way on you copying this channel because you didn't work getting like tons of views, but now you're copying, now you're copyright claiming me. So then I just went nuclear on their channel after they did that, after getting some advice on it. So, but, 
But even then, there's like another, I think there's another Russian gaming channel, which they basically copy my videos. Maybe one of them did have permission, another one didn't, but they've dubbed over them in Russian. So I'm thinking, okay, yeah, you know what? Like, this is like a different market than I was even appealing to. So even if, even if they're profiting off of that, it's like, it's, it's almost acting as like an ad for my stuff. And th this isn't a market I was even going to really make money off of anyway, because I wasn't going to have, I mean, I'd be happy if somebody wanted to submit Russian subtitles, but if they actually want it dubbed in Russian, then I wasn't going to do that. So th th this wasn't, this isn't a problem really for me. So I I'm generally going to be pretty easy going about that sort of thing. That doesn't mean I'm necessarily going to promote it or like it, but I just, I don't even have time to keep track of that sort of thing for the most part. So yeah, if you want to make videos with AI impersonating me, that's fine though. If you're doing, they'll do it in a way that there's at least some understanding this is AI. Like, uh, like if it's so good, you can't tell it's not me. Maybe list that like, you know, inspired by Ross Scott or something on, on there somewhere or not actually Ross in the credits or something. But, and even then, that's only if it's like not parody, you, you know, you're, you're trying, somebody's actually impersonating me, you know? So it's, so the same with, they made a video where it's just them impersonating me poorly. That's fine. That doesn't matter. I mean, again, it may not, I may not be, like it or be that interested in it, but whatever, you know, it's not, it's not a big problem for me. Uh, I'm not one of these people that's like insulted, you sully my name with even pretending to be like, no, it's, don't worry about it, you know. I guess what I don't want is, is you made like an AI impersonation so convincing that it, it, you're taking some, insane stance that I never said and it's like creating pro and it's not obviously like parody it's like creating problems it's being promoted as real as though I said that like in that rare I don't even know if that's even happened before but in that really rare scenario then like there could be legal consequences but anything less don't worry about it you know Okay, I mean, if it's obviously parody, you'd have nothing to worry about, so. Okay, so what? Oh yeah, okay, so this is an interesting question. What is the worst music that you love? They're saying not one song, but a band or artist or soundtrack. Well, if the music's really bad, I don't like it. <laughs> so, so I was trying to think of like, well, what's the stuff I like that either gives me like mixed feelings or else I kind of like it, but I can, I, I wouldn't recommend this to other people like, or very reserved recommendations. So I was trying to think of stuff like that. Um, I have a few candidates I wrote down. Okay, one was actually, uh, actually a few tracks. I mean, some of, some of the, so some of the soundtrack, I love it and would, endorse it wholeheartedly other tracks i'm like yeah this is i like this but i really hate other aspects of it was for uh sonic heroes in the game so, again some of the music is just fantastic but there's others i'm really conflicted on like like the end boss music me, the tune of that, I love it. Like the da 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 Like that starts off so great, and I like the overall tune. But then the singing, I'm just like, no, I hate this. I don't like this person's voice. I don't really like the song. Like, no, just shut up. Let me just hear the instrumental version. <laughs> so, so that's one where uh, that, that, that's one where I had like real mixed feelings. I, I would like that. You know, what was it? What I'm made of, I guess. And I'm probably insulting Sonic fans by saying that, but I love the tune. I don't like the, the singing in it. And like, even then the boss music for that, or one of the tracks, I think it's like This Machine or something. It's like, well, I, I don't hate the vocals, but it's like, I, I could do without them, <laughs> you know? Or or it's it's kind of it's kind of goofy in the sense that, like, this is actually kind of a pretty decent hard rock track 
but we're just talking about Sonic here, so it's like, well, yeah, not not so edgy there for fitting with the vibe. Or, or another track in that soundtrack, oh, the special stage bonus music, where that music is really cool and peppy, but it's going so fast, and it's like, it's almost bordering on like obscenely positive <laughs> with how it sounds. Like the that 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 track is like right at my threshold for how fast I want to tempo to music. You know, I mean that that's like I'm trying to think. I was gonna say that's faster than drums and bass, but I think it has some drums and bass in it. So I like drums and bass, but that's about my threshold for how fast I like a tempo. So, but, uh, yeah, it, th that's one where, like, I, I, I wouldn't recommend every track from there. To, and I have mixed feelings about that bonus music because that bonus music is so good, but it's so fast uh, and just obs outrageously positive. That's like, okay, well, kind of mixed feelings about this, but it is very good. Uh, and actually, I have a few other tracks like that um, that aren't that fast, but... There's some tracks I kind of like them, but they're so over the top positive. That's like, okay, I feel kind of weird listening to this. Um, one is, geez, this might be another one I might have to put out somewhere. Because uh, this is another one I grabbed back in the old mp3.com days. I think it's called Summer in Ozland. And it's just insanely positive. I, I've... I still have a copy somewhere. Like, I played this for, like, one friend, and, and he said he hears this, and, like, it makes them think of, like, elves and gummy bears jumping up, jumping around and stuff or something. <laughs> like, it, it's, I mean, it's well done, but it's, like, it's it's not normally the sort of thing I listen to, but it, it has kind of, like, a, a luring aspect to it, even despite the... Another one some people probably will know that's just like insanely positive is I've never played the game. I've never seen a playthrough, but I have listened to the soundtrack to Xeno Gears. And, and there's one track in there. I think it's called My Village is Number One. I'll, I'll put that in the notes. And that, that track, it's good. It's a great track. But again, it's like so positive to the point it's like, okay, this is kind of <laughs> kind of over the top here. And from what I've heard is, um, I, again, I, I don't know the story of Xenogears or anything, but from what I've heard is like something horrible happens to the village not long afterwards. So I guess that game's kind of setting you up to knock you down. Uh, I'll have to look. I, I doubt I'd like the gameplay, but it, it's got me curious because the music, there's a lot of good music in Xenogears in the soundtrack. So... Uh, yeah, somebody's saying it's peak camp. Uh, it could be, yeah. It, but there's some really talented music in there. So, uh, yeah, that, that's a whole series. I, I, I haven't listened to any of the other soundtracks. That's, that's another one of those, like, game series I kind of want to catch up on. Even even if I decide I'm not into the story at all, I want to hear more of the music because I liked what I was hearing. Um, okay, here's another weird example. Maybe a few of you have heard this. You know, from those big, from those giant game packs I bought from, I think it was itch.io. This is one of the games in there. Uh, it's called Bold Blade. And it's a pretty, it's a simple game, but it was kind of fun. It basically just involves you swinging around this sword that just gets bigger and bigger as you ha go after more enemies. It, it's kind of goofy, but the menu music in that, it's not like a great theme, but it kind of gets into my head, and in a way, I kind of like it. But I could see where people would hate that. It's like it's like dun, 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 like I don't know. It, it was uh, it, it, it's uh, it's odd, but it's like kind of hypnotic too. I I, I kind of like it, but I could see where people would hate it. Uh, from Bold Blade, and I, I guess the last candidate I had was the. South Park credits music, or it's like dun, 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 it's it's like bordering on the level of noise, but it, it's interesting. <laughs> so, I I I could see where you could say that's bad music, and I I could agree. Like yeah, but 
I, I kind of like the association from it. The, I'll, I'll put that one down in the links also. Uh, so yeah, I think, I think that's what I have for music that, oops, I lost my notes here. For music people might consider bad. Uh, let's see. What else do I have? Okay, so I guess I should move on to other questions. Let's see. Oh yeah, with Microsoft forcing Java, Minecraft Java users to migrate their accounts to Microsoft accounts, they made it so users who did not migrate their accounts within a certain time period would no longer have access to the game, nor would they be able to receive a free copy post-mortem. Yeah, that sounds very typical Microsoft. Now imagine them tying that to your operating system also. Well, like, yeah, imagine you did switch to a Microsoft account, but you can't use it unless you also update Windows and you don't want the new update. That's why in the United States, we've just, I feel like we've just kind of given up on antitrust. You, you know, we're, we're just not even trying anymore. Like it's, yeah, just, just do whatever you want, Microsoft. Just, you know, make sure we have defense contract deals with you and we will never come after you for antitrust. That, that's, that's what, I, that's what this feels like. Uh, and does this constitute as fraud as these users now have to pay for the exact same product? Well, no, it's like I said in the previous video, you can't have fraud if you don't have rights, <laughs> you know, you, you can't defraud an animal. <laughs> it's because it doesn't have legal rights or at least not those rights, you know, uh, I mean, it probably has animal cruelty. It probably has animal cruelty rights, and that's about it. You know, uh, so yeah, it, it's not in the United States. Now, maybe this could be actionable in Europe, but to me, this is another one of those cases where it's just kind of nebulous as to like, well, are they allowed to do that or not? And plus, I wouldn't call this an existential risk in this case because Microsoft existed as Java that you can run without having to connect to it or get, mod it that way for just a long time that this Minecraft is not at risk of going extinct, e even if nobody ever used the Microsoft version again. So I'm not too worried about this, but... Yeah, by all means, I mean, if somebody wants to act on it in another country, I, I think it's just, I, I think you would have an extremely difficult time doing this in the United States unless the end use, the EULA for the original Minecraft prior to Microsoft buying it had protections against this. and But then you wouldn't really be a affected by this because when Microsoft bought them out, they probably instigated a new EULA that you had to agree just to download the newer version, even the Java one that says they can do anything. So let's say you had like classic Minecraft pre Microsoft buyout and, and the EULA said that, you know, they won't, they're not going to force you to do this, which it might not even say that. Then you might have a case, except you would have never upgraded from that old pre-Microsoft version anyway. So no, that, I'd say in the United States, there's probably nothing you can do on this. So that's what I'm finding is that, no, the, the United States has this almost entirely locked up. The only thing, well, I do have an option for the crew for all players. I mean, for all owners, including the United States, it's not going to be through the United States. The only option I'm going to have for the United States is the FTC. And I am totally not holding my breath on that. That's like the least, that's the entire aspect of this campaign I'm the least confident of. And I'm honestly not expecting us to have any victory on that front. This is more to just close the book on it. So if we go through the, if we have a targeted complaints to the FTC on the crew and the FTC just tells us to go to hell, then that's it. There is no opportunity in the United States if you're not a millionaire. There's none whatsoever. I've, they've all been exhausted. All focus should be on outside of the United States. So that that's that, that's the only real benefit. Of it. But there is what 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 was it? Stokeones 
snowball's chance in snowball's chance in hell that the FTC does decide like yeah maybe this is off that they can't do anything because of the EULA. Let's look into this. Very very small chance, but not impossible. But but if the FTC says no, then that, that, that's it. We're done in the United States, ex- except for lobbying, which is unaffordable. So it's yeah. That, when I list all those things earlier in the other video for the crew, those are all things that have real chances of happening and government's going to have to respond if we get enough of them in. Like for some of these, it's mandatory. There's no, if they feel like it, they have to respond. Now they could come and say, no, go to hell. We're not going to do anything. But if there's even a chance and there sure as hell is much more of a chance in other countries it, it, things could happen, but yeah. I, now, of course, in a sane world, you'd be able to you'd be able to play Minecraft without having to have a Microsoft account. But that's not what we're in. So, I, again, don't, don't take anything of what I'm saying as a defense of that. It's more the it's more an acceptance of reality in the United States. And if I thought there was any way possible to not have this, I of course endorse that. It's just that it's so locked down legally in the US that it's, we've just handed all, we've handed the keys to the kingdom to the software industries. So, I mean, it's, we don't really have any power, you know, so. Oh yeah, I'm glad they had a clarification here because they say, "What's your favorite video game video game campaign?" And my first thought was, "Well, the one I'm doing right now to try to stop games from being destroyed because I think it has legs and something could happen from this." And at the very least, we're gonna get answers to everything, yeah, you know. So, or ninety percent. There's a few iffy parts, but we're gonna get we're gonna get ninety percent answers. Um, but then they're clarifying, no, the game campaign itself, both from a, they're saying both from a story and gameplay perspective. Um, well, shoot, for some reason, my brain filtered out gameplay perspective, because that's a great question, but I'm not, I don't know if I'm going to come up with, yeah, feel free to propose answers in the chat. Uh, for, well, for story, I like my favorite campaigns, even though I'm drawing a few blanks, are ones where where you end up is just like a world apart from where you started and things kind of escalated there the whole time. Uh, Like the, it's not my favorite game by any means, but one of these that kind of just take, starts kind of going off the deep end a bit is one that came to mind is uh, Descent Free Space, where it starts off with just this kind of, if, I, if my memory holds, with just sort of this like inter, interfactional space wars, or it's kind of like space politics. And then by the end of it, we're in this like kind of really weird aliens that are invading the galaxy. And uh, it, it, it's, it, it, I, I like it when game, when campaigns kind of throw you a red herring like that to, yeah, they, they kind of misdirect you to get you ready for the knockout punch of like the real threat you're facing, or the story's going to go into insane places, that sort of thing. Uh, yeah, somebody's saying, okay, I haven't played The Witcher Three: Blood and Wine expansion, so I can't comment on that. So I'm saying Warcraft Three: Reign of Chaos. Yeah, it does some of that. It's just I don't know. I never really, I never got like really into the story of Warcraft Three, but it. It certainly tries to do what I'm talking about. Uh, another example, well, another example I have, this is one where like the story just goes all over the place is a uh, Legacy of Cain series. So, I mean, yeah, especially once you get to Soul Reaver 2, that, that's, that's taken, that they're, they're keep, for a game about vampires just in a, just attacking Things like they go the extra mile trying to keep that story interesting, you know. Uh, somebody's mentioned Titanfall Two, which I finally played. Ah, uh, it's all right. I mean, it, it like 
the aesthetics of Titanfall 2 are great and the gameplay is pretty good. The story is just kind of so-so to me. I mean, I, I didn't really get... But yeah, there's a little bit of that. Uh, let's see. I mean, I mean it, it's fun. Don't get me wrong. It's just that when I think of like my all-time favorite campaigns... Okay, here's one where the story isn't that great, but maybe the gameplay aspect of it did like really make me appreciate it. it I was thinking when I beat Supreme Commander, like I, that was I just it felt so satisfying. Like seeing the cool out option that like they're talking about, okay, well the portal is gonna close, but we, we left you vodka in your in your mech, you know. Well, I guess for the faction I was playing, I was playing the Cybran. Uh it, it was uh, I found it's very satisfying, but the story itself is just kind of okay. I just, I think I had just got into the mood of it a whole lot. And of course the gameplay is fantastic for an RTS. Uh, so I'm saying they just like how they constantly add new gimmicks and mechanics for the levels. Oh yeah, with Titanfall 2. Yeah, they do, they do throw a lot at you. I guess I'm not... I'm pro I think it might be in the minority here, but I'm not someone who needs like lots of gimmick gameplay gimmicks like per level to keep you constantly going. What I just want is just maximum fun. So if you have like a really fun gameplay mechanic, but then you just kind of escalate it, you, you know, then that can be plenty for me. So you start off with just like like a minor skirmish and then you're escalating to like bigger missions and then by the end it's just like you're taking on practically an entire army or something but it's still that fun gameplay mechanic i'm fine with that but i know some people really do want like gameplay variety and experimentation that sort of thing so i mean i, I respect that it's just i, I just want f fun but what's fun is different for different people so um uh, I still need to play through the Metro 2033 series. So I can't comment on that. I've only played like the first 10 minutes or 20 minutes of the first one. That's one of those I've been meaning to come back to. Okay, so I'm saying Vertigo 2. It's a great half-like for VR. Okay. I don't know if I know that one. Huh. Oh, yeah, somebody's saying Silent Hill 2. That, that, Silent Hill 2 has a good story, but... I guess when I think of campaign, I, I tend, I guess they're just talking about like the single player story. When I think of campaign, I'm thinking more like, you know, it, it's kind of like wide encompassing. You know, you're going to lots of different places and uh, it, it story unfolds through that. Like, but yeah, you're right. It could just be like the single player story. I haven't played Bioshock 2. I've played Bioshock Infinite and the original. Although I didn't play the DLC for Infinite, so maybe I'm missing some of that. Let's see. I'm trying to think of this other great... Yeah, sorry. I am sort of dropped the ball on game... Well, okay, gameplay, I, re I mentioned it multiple times, but I really enjoyed the They Are Billions gameplay. That... It had it had one or two cheap tricks that I kind of worked around, but beyond that, it was a lot of fun. Uh, geez, there's there's a whole lot. I mean, but yeah, when I'm thinking campaign, I tend to think of like either like sort of like a military campaign or it's not my favorite game, though I know it has a cult classic. But one I'd say qualifies as a campaign would be uh, No One Lives Forever. Because you're, you're globe trotting in that one. You're going all over. And, well, I guess by that measure, you know, like, of course, like Deus Ex a whole bunch. But Deus Ex, I feel like it's more like just kind of everything coming together ra ra rather than like. But I do enjoy the campaign a lot to that. So. I don't know Klonoa. Sorry, somebody's asking about that. Yeah, I'm trying to think of some other, like, really great campaigns. That's the thing. I've played so many games where the where I think the campaigns were like, yeah, that was good. That was fun. It just has to be rare when I find the ones that are just, like, blowing me away. You know, that. Well, actually, somebody mentioned it earlier. Serious Sam 2. Well, a lot of the Serious Sams have, have really interesting campaigns that... that 
they have that kind of epic feeling once you've beaten it. You know, the it feels like it was a real experience. Yeah, that, that's what I like. I, I so I think Max Payne. That is, again, I think we're kind of blurring what campaign means. Uh, but yeah, no, Black, Max Payne's a great game. I guess my favorite games of the campaign they tend to have that feeling where after you finished it, you're just kind of like you're you're kind of like grinning and you're kind of just stunned a bit because so much happened that it, it kind of wowed you in a sense that it's just like, wow, this was amazing. And that, that's the, the kind of campaigns that do that with me are rare. They, they happen, but you know, it's, I have not played Halo 2. I've only played the first Halo, but though maybe I'll catch up eventually and do the Master Chief collection or something. Like like if I'm hungry for more sci-fi and I feel like I'm scraping the barrel. Uh, yeah, somebody's saying they see campaign more like RTS stuff. Yeah, I, I kind of do too, but uh, it's I, I feel like if you're traveling a lot and as the you have like a wide arcing story that like uh, this is just my association with it that like you know you're going to different locations and you're. I feel like what you get from a campaign that you don't get from a regular game story, in my association, is that by seeing all the parts in different places play out together, you eventually start getting like this kind of like wide view of what was happening. So, so it's like no one location can kind of tell the whole story, but but by experiencing the entire thing like in separate chunks, it, it together forms this larger story that you finally get it. And it's like, you almost couldn't if you didn't experience it in different ways, you know, or something. Like it, it all kind of comes together. And you tend to have that more with strategy games that, that you, f like you understand it on a level that you wouldn't if it was just like a story in the, Characters going from this scene to this scene, so that clearly leads to this. This is more like it's a difference between like uh, again using war campaigns analogies. It's a difference between like like understanding a battle and everything that played out in that versus the entire war, like what was happening here, what was happening here, because this because politics were going on over here. And it's like. It just kind of like a web that kind of comes together, I think. So, I mean, I'm, I'm sure there's some non-strategy games that do that, but it, it's rarer, you know, for for non-strategy ones. So, okay, yeah, somebody's giving Outer Wilds. That's an that's an example. I mean, that, that one's not my favorite, but that, that's another one that's like it's, yeah, that that one definitely fits that criteria that I'm talking about, where you know you don't get it all at once or from the individual events, but by seeing everything and eventually putting it together, that finally makes the larger picture. So yeah, you're right. Outer, Outer Wilds definitely qualifies for that kind of thing. I have not played Disco Elysium yet. It's on my two play, but I got to finish Planescape Torment first it is, is my criteria for Disco Elysium. Oh. Um. Let's see. Somebody saying Mass Effect games kind of do that. Yeah, yeah, Mass Effect games do that to an extent, where you get you get the larger picture. That, yeah, that there's, yeah, I associate bigger picture stuff with campaigns, whereas fantastic game stories can all be pretty tight, you know, in, in their scope. Uh, yeah, so uh, I just figured that out on the fly. That's how I distinguish a gameplay story experience versus the campaign, you know. The campaign's going to be big, <laughs> you know, so. All right. Um, let's see. After you finish the movie, would you let someone make the movie the video game? What genre of game would it be? Well, uh, the movie is going to be loosely inspired off a mod for a game. So I kind of want to keep that under wraps. So yes, clearly you could make a game based off the movie if you wanted to. And, and part of the unique, well, I, I say unique, unique then, it's probably not as unique now, uh, gameplay 
of that is part of what inspired it. So uh, it, it's, I don't want to give too many hints on that. Sorry. I, I guess I can say it would be for the genre. I, I'm not even sure exactly what genre this is. I'd say strategy-ish. Strategy-ish. You know. Let's see. What do you think of the GTA 6 publisher saying games should be priced by the hour? I, I didn't... I hadn't heard that. It's a rock star, I guess. I guess it depends. Was that out of context? Or no, they mean it straight up. They're, that's what. That's the dream for them. I mean, if if they're just talking like off the cuff, like, man, it'd be so cool if we could do that. I mean, uh, companies say stuff like, the, okay, they're saying Take Two said that. Okay, so not Rockstar. Um, I, I mean, good luck, <laughs> you know. You, you know, pe you're, you're going to have to have a really good game. I'm thinking even for people who pay, you know, for like World of Warcraft or something every month, you start going by the hour. I don't know, man. That, that I, I've look. It's a stereotype that's kind of well deserved that gamers will kind of buy almost anything if the game's good, you know, even if they're bad deals or really hostile consumer practices. I have more faith in gamers than that to buy games priced by the hour in any significant degree. Like, I think that's going to take a sea change mentality to get gamers to go back to that. Because I say back to that, that because that's sort of what you had from arcades, you know, loosely. I guess in a few cases, literally. There were a few arcade games that operated by the minute, but... Uh, and that was a long time ago, and there are much better, the industry has better standards than arcade machines for the most part now, even with microtransactions and loot boxes and crap like that. If you have some discipline, yeah, if you have no discipline, then I guess it could, could get worse even, but, uh, I have a little more... I have a I have more faith in gamers than that. Like I think that one's going to be a hard sell. I mean, I'm never going down that. Okay, no, the only way I would go down that route is if the dream software exists. So, if I run those games, I can be ripping the maps as I play them. Then I might do like a cost benefit analysis in my head. It's like, okay, if I can get all these levels for $5 and then run around in VR yeah, maybe that might be worth it. And then I, I, that's the only possible way I would ever touch something like that. Um, I, I can't see even average gamers doing that for, I don't want to say never, but decades. Uh, and again, that, of course, if one company does that and like a small handful of gamers do that, yes, I could see that. But I mean, as something that's a viable business model, I, I, I'm not seeing it. Um, uh, and of course, that's just on whether they can get away with it. You know, I mean, just from mar just from the market, you know. I mean, from personally, I think that's just, that's the exact opposite of what I would want from a game, <laughs> you know. I like being able to buy a game, then it's mine, then I can play it indefinitely or put it off, play it later or come back to it 10 years, you know. Or, or or come back to it and mod it, and now I have it in stereoscopic, and it's like a new, brand new experience or something. So, playing by the hour. I mean, look, I play games for primarily for escapism. So I don't want to have to think about the real world, or you know, money matters. That's like the last thing I want in a game. If I have money matters in a game, I want it, want it to be because I don't have enough gold coins from killing goblins or something. Because that, that's not going to hit me on the same level level as like budgeting so I have enough for rent and groceries or stuff. D different parts of the brain there. So the more stuff that reminds me of real world monetary transactions or remind me, hey, you're playing a game. Would you like to buy more stuff? 
that just turns me off from the game. So, uh, I will say my, pro well, well, I, I guess our, you know, I, I helped with the drafting, but you know, it, it's a group consensus for these proposals we're submitting to government. Those proposals will not protect you against this until they end support. And then the, actually, that, that's a weird, this is a really weird area I wasn't anticipating. Th they might apply to this. It, it's, if they ended support and you were paying by the hour, I, I don't know. If they were selling additional features, it might, but I, I don't know. That might, hopefully we won't have to come back to this, but yeah, that, I admit, I wasn't forward-thinking enough to plan for charging by the hour. <laughs> so, th th that's game industry innovation for you, you know. Think up new ways to make people pay. <laughs> but, yeah, it's... Oh, oh, yeah, but hopefully other people can fight that fight on it. it and hopefully they don't make anything really good if they do try it. It'll, because I mean, I could see a game company trying it. I could see people, yeah, you won't even buy that game, renting it for a couple hours and they'll make YouTube videos on it. And then I think it'll flare off and that's it. Like, and it probably won't recoup the cost, recoup the cost. So, yeah. All right, m more questions. Uh, how far have we come with the plan? We are coming awesome, but I still have a lot of work to do. So it's, look, I'm going to, I'm going to, I feel extremely confident. I'm going to hit my goal of exhausting all options. So by the end of this, and by the end of this, we've, we've either saved games or we know it's literally impossible. Like there's just no way. It's just impossible in this timeline. So... That that's what I'm aiming for, and so I'm, I'm gonna. I think we're gonna hit it. So, and I think we have a really decent chance, actually. Assuming there's not very large forces at work, I'm unaware of, but this will un, this will uncover them if there are. So, so he's asking, can you try to make more low effort videos of some interesting games and topics that you have? an option about, but are not worth spending too much time on. I was hoping to cover more Commodore 64 games kind of like that. Um, so, and this other one I was doing where I wasn't going to be doing the bulk of the editing. I was just going to, uh, like I've written it and just have editing notes and I'll just kind of loosely approve it. It's going to be kind of like that Star Trek one I did, but I just, this game thing just started escalating more and more. And I, and it just became, it's just become a gauntlet of how many things I've had to organize and research. But it, it's, it's getting there. It's getting there. So, hey, hey, the UK, the UK proposal has been submitted. The phase one complete. So, you know, we got to get the phase three before it really starts popping off. But that, that's okay. You know, so it, it's happening. It's happening. Uh, but yeah, no, I like, I, I like that idea and I might do more of it, but. I think Commodore 64 games would be a great place to start. And I think it's the sort of thing where I would want to time it kind of close to uh, like a real like kind of full meat game dungeon. So that way people don't feel like they're getting robbed. Whereas if I've gone for months and haven't had one, then I release a, a short one, that people aren't going to like that. They want some, They want the real full experience. So if I do it shortly after that, I think people will be a lot more receptive to it. So, yeah, yeah, I, I don't want a Diablo Immortal mentality, you know, where people have been waiting a long time for Diablo and then you announce a mobile game. That's not what people want to hear, <laughs> you know. So, whereas if you did that alongside, uh, like a full sequel, then people are way more receptive to that. So, uh, Do you think it might be worth lowering the technical production quality on Freeman's mind too? They're saying adding in the extra sound effects and extra map sections, nice, but seems to be slowing down production a lot. No, it's mostly me. It's mostly just 
sitting there thinking of what to say, then recording it, then all the little steps. That all this stuff does take time and it does add to the, it, it does delay it, but it doesn't seep into my time that much. So if, if the problem wasn't me, I could just say, all right, done, send to this person. Okay, now queue up the next one. Okay, send, so queue up the next one. And I could just keep working ahead. But it's just, I'm, I'm unfortunately been biting off a little more than I can chew, but I, I don't have a choice in this game thing. I have to see that through. But it's all the hardest work on that's going to be done by early April because I still have a lot to do after that, but it's mostly just going to be publicity and media stuff and just getting attention. And that's so much easier than what I've been doing. <laughs> so, but like I, I could go on for an hour every day on this for like a month and that'd be a lot easier than the organizing and researching and verifying, you know, verifying the process. Cause we're basically trying to make this as easy as possible for everyone involved in this. So that involves a lot of prep work. So let's see. So they're saying they love to see me play Need for Speed 2 and 3. I'd love to be able to play those in stereoscopic. But let's see. Uh, what, okay, I lost my spot. When it comes to archiving and preservation of games, Ross, which is very beneficial, can the same be said when it comes to their prototype versions and unused cut content? And they mentioned there were, they archived prototype, prototypal mods and games as well, like the Serious Sam public evaluation build, which I hadn't even heard of. I looked it up after I saw this. Yeah, it, it was neat. I think they got most of the stuff that they had in there into the games, but yeah, there was some stuff that I was feeling like, yeah, they didn't really have anything quite like this, but I mean, yeah, that can be neat and great too. It's just that I, I feel like we're not being robbed with those because there's two things. One, I want developers to kind of feel free to do whatever they want in production. It's only once you're asking for money from the customer that you really need to be held to some standards. So if they decide they hate it and they don't want it to see the light of day, well, I feel like that's kind of their choice, even though a lot of fans probably would like to see it um, and are appreciative of that. Yeah, I guess sometimes it's not even really their choice, but the publisher choice too. And yeah, of course I'd like this. I'd like to have more decisions be in control up from the developers rather than the publishers. But you know, that that's... Yeah. You think what I'm doing is difficult. That, that's that's like gargantuan. That's like, I, I can't even do that because you'd have to upend existing power structures in society. That, that that's, too, that's too big, you know. Uh, but, yeah, I, I guess the other thing was the, well, I mean, sometimes they don't want to like color the impression of the final game. But yeah, I guess, so they don't want you to see like all the ugly spots because then you'll think of that when you see the fresh spot. I can understand that mentality. That's probably not as common. I will say as someone who creates things, though, there's a high chance they probably value it a lot less. I mean, I tend to do that because if I, like say I have like a rewrite or some takes, unless they're, really good in, in an unexpected way. I'm thinking, okay, well, this is just a weaker joke. I'm just gonna throw this out. I, I, the joke I have better here now is a lot better. I'm just, and I just don't really pay mind to that past that. So I, I guess that could be frustrating for you, for some people on their end where they wanna see everything. But from a creative perspective, speaking for, for myself, you know, I, I'm trying to just go for whatever I think is the best. So if, if this is just like substandard, then it's like, well, whatever, you know, but I, I don't, I feel like it's not a great loss. And I feel like there is some truth to that for a lot of games too, where not all of them, but some of the pre-release stuff, it's like, okay, this looks like the final version. It's just like, it just looks a lot crappier and it's clunkier. And, you know, I mean, there's other, there, they can scrap good ideas though. Uh, I'm, it's just on my mind lately because somebody reached out to me. They had some 
uh, uh, Quake Wars community. And I remembered how in Quake Wars, there's some preview screenshots, I think, of levels that made it, that never made it into the final game. Like, they have, like, lots of foliage that I'm thinking, I don't think this is anywhere in the game that they have this. So I, I would have liked to have seen some of the earlier, more ambitious stuff. Oh, yeah, I think they're... I think I saw screenshots where they had better graphics than the final version, where like the, the resolution was higher and like the lighting was a little better. Yeah, that's always frustrating when they downgrade it, but yeah, it, I don't know. That doesn't burn at me the same way though, because if it's unfinished, it's still unfinished usually where it's like, let's say it was really great, but then they only had the game 60% done. Now, some people would be dying for that, but my attitude is like, well, if they never got to a full game, it's just not on the same level as something that made it to ship. And again, if they're not taking your money and it's their stuff, it's like, well, it's kind of their right. I, Assuming it's the developers making that decision, so. Let's see. Uh, okay, I'll just answer this quick. I haven't played Half-Life 2 VR. That's probably like the one game I'm probably not in a rush to play in VR because I just know Half-Life, I've seen so much of it that even though VR is a different experience, I've seen so much of it that I, I almost want to see any other game. Not because I hate it, just because it's, I know this, you know. And the other is, do you plan on reusing game footage for these kinds of streams again? They, mi they miss those. Well, the thing is, I went out of my way to make those foot to make that footage, and it was actually cutting into my time to make that. I don't record most of my gameplay stuff. I mean, I, I guess I could, and also it could, some of it could be kind of distracting or be make you kind of queasy depending on how I was playing, you know. So I, I don't really want to do that, but I, I don't know. It was just. Look, I consider these chats like low priority uh, as far as things go. Like, so if I'm just kind of half-assing it, that's fine because that creates more time for the videos that matter. So I, I tend to be pretty aware of not spending too much time on these. So, uh, I, I think that I think it makes sense that you'd rather have a good video worth watching or rewatching than you know, the video chat's done a, put together a little bit better, you know. Uh, okay, I may start skipping some since, let's see. I have not heard of the Blue, of the blue Man group. Okay, they think I would enjoy them. Maybe, oh, oh yeah, well, I do have two recommendations that uh, Master Cookie has given me lately. One was Henry's Kitchen. It's a YouTube show where it's just kind of a slightly unhinged cooking show. And I, I don't enjoy cooking at all, but I, I enjoy watching these. Uh, and then the latest one he gave me was, I think it's called On Cinema at the Cinema, where, again, it's kind of a not very good movie review show that seems to be increasingly getting more unhinged and has, like, a lot of underlying tension but between the reviewers and lots of awkward moments that yeah it's it's my kind of like surreal humor like it's so the, I, I can give those recommendations the uh, master cookie's been giving me some good picks for, from that so sometimes when i don't have much time i'll just watch I, I only found out about it on cinema like in the past couple days but henry's kitchen sometimes i'm watching like you know, they're only like five, 10 minutes. So I'll watch one and go to bed or something like that. So I, 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 I give, to me, that's like stuff like that. Like in a perfect world, it would be like the meat of YouTube, you, you know, where it, it's just this kind of amateur kind of off kilter comedy stuff. That's just like, this is perfect. This is, this is exactly the sort of thing I want from YouTube, you know, <laughs> things like that. So. Uh, okay, somebody, I, I still haven't played Disco Elysium. I, I'll probably play it eventually, but. Oh yeah, do you think there are any skills that you will have to learn within the upcoming decades to 
upkeep your way of desired living because your surroundings indirectly forces you into it. <laughs> I, I, it just now hit me the wording of that question could be quite different. Um, okay, well, my original thought before I read that more closely was that, oh yeah, and they're, they're talking about people born pre-1950s had to learn digital technology to pay bills, park their car in town, et cetera. Uh, well, I mean, for just for my projects, I'm, I'm going to need to learn a lot more of Unreal Engine or possibly other game engines and animation techniques and software. A AI will be uh, coming into play at somewhere. Like, yeah, I'll, if I can, I would love to have AI-assisted animation sequences. I'm not talking about like drawing or something like I'm talking about like the actual data that moves the characters around, you know, so if I wanted somebody like with an ax chopping wood and I don't have access to that animation, we could try to get the AI to see if it can play that out. And if it does a decent job, then great. Again, I'm not going to just dump AI, everything to AI. There's going to be quality control, but if I can take shortcuts and I think, yeah, this looks decent, I'm going to take it. But I mean, for like a 3D machinima type thing, animation is where just the bulk of the work is. So it's, uh, I, I also need to get my act together researching and re responding to people. Like, listen, if you've written to me, like I think in December on the audio stuff, I am not ignoring you on purpose. It's just, I, I need to get this, I, I need to get like tests together for the audio help to, see if you're like gonna be like helpful fit for me. I've just been so busy that with this campaign that it's just been, I keep neglecting that, so. But yeah, AI assisted thing was with audio. Like for example, like AI assisted audio cleanup and volume leveling. That's something I need to gonna need to research more at some point. Uh, one thing I guess I am kind of boomerish on is like with mobile devices, I mean, I, I I almost never use my phone except for just a phone call or to receive like, you know, two factor authorization text messages. It's like, all right, got this code, got to enter it in. I don't use it for much beyond that. And I can see where that could become more of a liability as time goes on. Uh, let's see. Well, I'm going to have to learn more Polish for where I am. Uh, but yeah, going by this question again. So th those are my original thoughts. And now they're saying skills to learn within the upcoming decades to upkeep your way of desired living. If we're talking decades, that can mean a lot. That can mean like learning how to filter water, learning how to grow crops, like uh, l learning how to like repair tool, yeah, fix tools, uh, who knows what's going to go on in the future if you're talking decades, you know, uh, or, or just like learning. Yeah, l lots of repair stuff, I would think, could come into play. Or like basic wiring or plumbing or like th all these basic things that we kind of associate with modern society. Who, who knows what's going to be required in decades? So, yeah, it could be you have to start learning a whole lot of skills. So, let's see. So we're saying modern youth is moving away from smartphones because being offline is increasingly considered a luxury. Yeah, like I, I can understand not wanting to have to respond to people, you know. Like, like you know, if you just want to play a game or watch a movie or something, you know, you don't want to have to have 50 messages or or, or people knowing that's what you're doing, you know, and they can interrupt it. Or So, yeah, who, who knows? Uh... Okay, yeah, somebody's mentioning Yahtzee forms Second Wind, and... Okay, apparently they've given me an open invite to appear. Well, I'll absolutely take them up on it in April onward. R right now, there's not much point in having extra publicity because when I have publicity, I want to steer people straight to the site, which I get and just be able to explain what we're doing and how they can act. And the site will kind of redirect everyone to like petitions or taking action on the crew or whatever. So 
it'll be much more of like a functioning machine than at that point, in which case media is only going to help. Right now, I wouldn't have a place, I wouldn't have an easy, easy place to send you to. So it, to me, it would be a waste to get the media attention. But after that, everybody's open. I'll reach out to a lot, uh, just everybody I can, just about, so. Okay, here's a question, if I can answer it quick. They're saying, what are your custom H.264 compression settings and handbrake for your videos? I think it's X.264, actually, but here, I'll pull it up. Uh, there's some stuff I remember off the top. Okay, I need to find a video to, Oh, they don't have the dialogue. I gotta drag something. Okay, one second. That will work. Okay. So I have. Okay, so the, the basic settings are it says H.264, and then in parentheses it says X264. So I'm not sure which then. I have a constant frame rate. I have the slower encoding setting. I have constant quality of 17, you know, the sear ref. I found that was like a good balance between like, it's not archive quality, but it's pretty good. Like, it, you gotta go a lot lower for archive quality, but. And let's see, encoder two, none, encoder profile, high, encoder level auto. And then I have a custom stuff under advanced options. Though I think this is just to get the color right. Here, I'll post that in the chat. So this is under advanced options, I have this. And somebody helped me with that in the past where like when I output from the, when I output it, it's in lossless RGB. And I found if I don't have that, it tends to screw up the color. So like, like the color space. But if I have that, then it stays cor uh, correct pretty much. So that may not be necessary depending on how you're exporting it, but I need that setting or else reds are gonna look a little too orange and greens will be a little off and stuff like that. So um, let's see. The So yeah, th those are the settings. I, like, I did a lot of like analysis where I would just be like staring at frames under different conditions and then sometimes doing like frame by frame comparisons and I found like between the size trade-off versus the quality, 17 was about like a decent compromise. So that's the setting that's probably gonna determine things the most for the quality on X264 encoding. And, and yeah, this one's different. I, for for the, like the encoder preset, I've heard, I, I, I did some quality testing on that too, and I've heard in theory, all that matters for like the fast versus slow is the is how much space that takes up for X264 encoding. But I found it's a little different. Apparently it, 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 it can be, it cannot just save space doing the slower encoding, but it can also, uh, I, I found it can help the quality slightly. That said, medium is still pretty good for X264. Now for uh, X265, that's a totally different story where the, the more intensive the encoding, the more space it takes up and it clearly looks better. So I'm not sure, like for X264 stuff, for stuff I don't care about the quality quite as, I mean for X265 stuff, stuff I don't care about the quality qu quite as much, I just want a copy that I'm willing to burn some, I'm willing to kind of compress harder. I usually do the slow setting for that because it's way more intensive doing X265 encoding. X265 gives you better quality for lower bit rate stuff. But I found for high bit rate, X264 is still better. Maybe you can find some fringe scenarios where that's not the case. Or, or if your resolution is just huge. Like if you were doing like 4K or 8K stuff, then X265 tends to become kind of like you don't want to do that X264 in general, so. But if it's like 1080, then it's different. Okay, I, I'm probably boring everybody who doesn't care about video stuff now, so I should go to more questions. So I'm saying that why no indie developer managed to make a good spiritual successor to Tyrion? 
I dream of roguelike shoot him up. Well, I don't know if Tyrion was roguelike, but that's a great idea having a roguelike shoot him up. Um, the well, there was that one I played. Jeez, I forgot the name of it. It was something Storm in the name. That's one where it was. It's more than a spiritual successor because they like. I think they got permission, but they lifted a whole lot of assets too. The title of it's on. If you go to a Curse Farms junk channel, I have a video where I showed the ending because literally nobody put the ending up. So I figured, okay, I, I think it was something like Against the Storm or something Storm. But yeah, it was all right. I don't think it was quite Tyrion quality, but it was, if you're hungry for more Tyrion, it'll help feed you, you know? So. Do you ever regret using Half-Life Source for Freeman's Mind? Especially considering how much of a broken mess it is compared to the original Gold Source version? No, because I got ragdolls with gold, with Half-Life Source. That was the number one reason I did it. I like, I, I like ragdolls. So, but, and, and actually it, it has advantages and disadvantages to gold source. So for, for the video making. Okay. I still need to play the designer games. And somebody answered another question about honey mustard or barbecue sauce. I, I just hate vinegar that I, I'm weird like that, but I just hate it. So I don't like those sauces. Although some barbecue potato chips don't have vinegar and like and those taste all right. So uh let's see. If you were a ghost, what kind of ghost would you be? What type of location would you want to haunt? I, I'd probably just go for the classics and just so, something where I could scare teens or you're gonna get the best reaction of people just freaking out but like you know rumors that something's haunted and, and then what you do you just lure them in and then bore them for a few hours and then and then once they're thinking about leaving then you lure them in a little more like give something a little weird and then the lure them a little more then you scare the living hell out of them so it's, it's probably one like that you know yeah it, it's 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 not the most original it's just the classic style but that's probably most satisfying Let's see. And, and for some reason, something just came to mind. Be a ghost that gives bad stock tips, you know? So so they, they see a stock tip written in like the dust or something and they're like, oh God, I'm gonna put money on this. And then no, it's just, I'm just making stuff up, you know? Uh, let's see. If time and money were an issue, would you go to the U.S. and drive Joey's route across the USA? Yeah, I think so. If we had enough good destinations, especially because I think like one of my least favorite spots would have been like Las Vegas. And I used to think there just wasn't anything I was interested in in Las Vegas because it's in the middle of the desert and I don't, I'm not interested in gambling. But then I, I learned, but uh, I've since learned Omega Mart is located in Las Vegas and I absolutely would want to go there. And there's also this kind of zip line above this mall that looked pretty fun to take too. So I could probably find these like lesser advertised attractions and probably have a lot of fun out of that. But yeah, that'd be great to go to all these different locations and then have fun places to visit. Sure. I mean, as long as I could line up fun places to check out, so. Let's see. Okay, longer question. Okay, so somebody answered it and they, they backed. Yeah, they were asking about ads. I've talked about that before. I just, I want to avoid them if I can. I just, again, I try to look at all the videos as though I was the audience. And if I if I didn't know anything about it, would I want to watch this? And I wouldn't want to watch, well, I mean, I probably would if it was good enough, but I would want to skip over the ad. So, and that, that would just kind of detract from it for me. And I understand why people do it. I mean, I'm not like trying to pretend like, you know, 
No, I mean, I realize I'm lucky that I can afford not to do that. Is basically what it, I mean. Besides the besides the basic ads on the videos, you know, where you just have something at the beginning and then maybe something at the end. You, you know, not just having like an in an in video sponsored ad or something where it's taking up about sixty seconds or something. Forget. Yeah, like even in these. We'll see with the fundraiser, but even if I try to get like, I say ads, they're more like public service announcements to mention uh, the crew shut down and how you can stop games from being destroyed. They can take up 10 seconds, maybe less if they talk fast and, and just say, so I, I want to like disrupt the, orig the original broadcast as little as possible. And I kind of want, and, and that's if they're interested in doing it. If they don't want to, then I'm not. Of course, I'm not going to, like, push them to do it. Well, well, actually, I, I feel like there's a hierarchy because, like, at the top would be people who want me to come on for a video appearance or something and talk about it. And then below that, maybe I could, like, make just a quick message or something. Or, or they'll, I won't, they don't want me on their show, but they'll, they're willing to, get, like, give me a quick mention of uh, 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 what I'm doing on one of their videos. And then below that would be, like, well, you make a Twitter post if you have like a big audience saying, you know, so at least some of your audience is seeing that. So I'll take anything, you know, with on this movement. Okay. Uh, do you think you'll be go back to streaming highly requested games from fans on Twitch again? Yeah, maybe. I mean, once I get more time, though, that's the pro okay. I skip one, but I answer this. Like, I started playing one game. A little bit, and I realized, oh, actually, this might have been better for Twitch. Uh, it's called Reventure, where it's it's not a time loop game exactly, but it sure plays a whole lot like one. So it, it's like a platformer time loop-ish game. It's, it's relatively fun. I realized, yeah, this probably would have been better on stream, but oh well. Uh... And I ha I haven't said no, I haven't said never to uh, Death Trap Dungeon revisiting that. Because is if people really wanted to see more of that, maybe I could kind of tough through more of that because that has a certain appeal with more people involved. No. Yeah. Uh, have you ever been into classic city builders and real time strategy games like Command and Conquer or Sim City series? Uh, yeah, I mean, World with real-time strategy games, I never really stop liking them, especially if the mechanics or the theme is good. Uh, I'm, I literally, and I'm a latecomer on Command & Conquer, I, I've literally played them for the first time past, like, a demo or something. Like, I played through the campaign of the original, like, I think it was last year? Yeah, they're, they're good. And I started, I kind of gave up on um, Red Alert and... Two, but I, I still want to watch through all of them, and I'll probably try again for three and maybe Red Alert two, and just see which ones I like more and which ones I I'd rather just watch. But yeah, no, I, I plan to go through all of them. I, I, I like the I, I like the series like thematically. It, it's, it's but yeah, yeah, I, I like the the campiness of it too. That that. that they do camp. They do campy right. That they know what they're doing with the campiness. So, and of course the soundtracks are great and gameplay is fun. It's just like some of them. It, I was liking the theme more than others. So, and, and, and thus for city building games, I do like them, but it kind of I, I'm a little pickier on those where it's well one I have to like the theme of it, and two. I tend to like stuff where there's like an objectives and some sort of payoff for it. So th that could be simple though. Like if it's like a storyline and I know I'm going to get like some like cutscenes or something from it, that that's good. Then I'm, I'm on board with it. But if it's like just making the city and developing it, I, I tend to kind of lose, I tend to not be as interested in those unless like the city itself is just, like so elaborate and interesting and maybe it has like a 3d mode where I can walk around in it afterwards. And then, then I'm interested in more from just the perspective, like, Oh, I can feel like I'm exploring this city. So it's kind of like interested in it from another angle, but 
Yeah, I, I kind of like city management stuff, but again, I have to like really be on board with the theme or some aspects to it that just kind of keep me going beyond just the gameplay, like some story element or like interesting dialogue from a lot of characters or something if I keep going or something like that. So, okay. I may start skipping a few more. Sometimes we're getting a request for Game Dungeon or Arcane Studios game. Yeah, I, well, maybe. I still, I'll probably do Dishonored eventually. I'll have to get a mod to try to get rid of the color tinting on it. I, I don't like a lot of color tinting. And that, that the, the sort of brown or yellow, fil yellow filter they had on it, just, I don't know, it just turned me off in the mood of it. But I, I, I'm someone who can really have be impacted by the atmosphere or the aesthetics of something, so... Yeah, like I, I mentioned before, like I think of people ask like what clan I might be in for Vampire the Masquerade. Like I, I feel like it would either be Malkavian or Toreador. Because like in the in the lore of the Toreadors, if they see something that they just find it's like utterly beautiful artistically, that can practically stun them. And I, yeah, that can be kind of like me. So. Uh, let's but it works in the reverse too. If I just hate the aesthetics of something, it's gonna give me a bad, it's gonna give me a bad attitude about it that never goes away really. Okay, I'm gonna skip more. I don't have like great answers for, or else would need more. <clears throat> well, okay, I guess I can answer this one. What's your opinion on the emerging popularity of full frontal nudity in video games? Do you think it's good for immersion to depict non-sexual nudity? Does it have any artistic value at all? <clears throat> at all? Well, I kind of talked a little bit about that in the Black Mirror episode. Like, I, again, I like like the nude statues they had in that, and uh, what was it Symphony of the Night? You know, Castlevania Symphony of the Night. Kind of low definition, but that's. The, I, I feel like it if you do it just right, it can add to the aesthetics of it. And like, well, with. Uh, Path of Exile has that also. Like, they'll have like the Roman style statues that come to life, and in this in the case where they're like trying to imitate like Greek or Roman statues, it's it almost wakes me up a little more if it doesn't have the nudity or if they're like fig leaves all, all over everything because I know it's it's less authentic then. Uh, whereas if they uh, if they have it, I'm thinking, I'm feeling like, okay, well, this is more like the real McCoy of what they're trying to imitate. I mean, for other things, I guess it just kind of, this is the sort of thing where it depends a whole lot on the game and what you're trying to do and the mood. Because, yeah, you can obviously use it tasteful. You can obviously use it tastelessly uh, if you're, but you can also use it into like a, to like, make it kind of hilarious also, or just have that kind of artistic slant to it. But, uh, I mean, it can work, you know, just, you got to know your audience too. Cause if you're going for like, I mean, those games I'm mentioning, they're, they're all mature rated, you, you know, it's, if you're going for like maximum audience then yeah, you probably don't want nudity or you do want things kind of covered up more, but. And it's not necessary for a lot of games either. So, but yeah, it, it just varies. You know. or, or, or I was thinking, or you can do like the Sims and just have like the sensor blocks. If, if you don't mind breaking the fourth wall a little bit, you know. Okay, well, I'll just answer this quick. Maybe I should do it on the website. I just... I guess I could add that if it's like off to the side. They're saying, can you make a playlist or category in your channel with all the Dead Game News episodes in it? I have one on the website. Just go to cursefarms.com, click on videos. There's one for Dead Game News. It has all the episodes in it, I believe. Um, but yeah, I don't have a YouTube playlist. So I would, uh, maybe I should put that on the site later. That's one of those things where I kind of neglect things that are probably more important than easy, but... I, I, I tend to beeline on the things that are harder and going to bother me if I don't get them done. 
And my brain can kind of dismiss the easier stuff sometimes. But even though I know I shouldn't. Okay, I haven't been following the details on this, but they're saying uh, recently the House representatives in the U.S. Okay, oh, so the House passed it. Oh, boy. Uh, passed a bill that would force TikTok to either be bought out from ByteDance, the parent company, by American investors, or face being banned altogether. What's your take on it? Again, I haven't really been following it. Somebody sent me a clip where they're... Where, where, uh, uh, I think it was Pelosi was saying that, saying like, yeah, we're not trying to ban, make it better, tic-tac-toe. It, it just came across as aw awkward and kind of out of touch. But it's it's the sort of thing where this sounds a lot, I don't know if it got shot down or mutated and that's what this is now, but th there were two bills proposals a while back. One was restrict and the other was earn it. And I think this one sounds a lot like restrict where they were trying to ban TikTok, but it also had language open enough that they could ban like basically any foreign media company that they wanted for like anything. So it's like, yeah, that's not a great precedent, but I, I mean, I, me personally, I, this is the sort of thing where, like, me personally, I don't care because I don't even use TikTok. I, although maybe I will for the game campaign just to have, like, one video up on it if it's not banned by then. <laughs> but I can see where this can be, like, a slippery slope thing where they're, okay, now they're going to ban other things unless they fall in line with what the government wants. And who knows? Well, it's like I was joking when the – or half joking in the – uh, was a state of mind episode where, where you have the government office right there in the newsroom. Um, almost like, yeah, okay, the government's going to oversee like what media is fit to put out now. So it's like, yeah, great. That, that, that's exactly what everybody wants. So again, I don't know a lot of details on it. I, I think it's probably not taking us to great places, but whatever, you know, uh, Land of the free. <laughs> yeah. All right. Uh, oh, yeah. Okay. I guess I have a minor correction to make. They're saying, it's come to my attention that Counter-Strike 2 has been released, but in a way that did not resonate with him. And then they replaced Counter-Strike Go, uh, CSGO. I was wrong in one of my earlier videos where I said that Valve killed it. Technically, they didn't. And that was me just not having time to research it properly. It can be hell to research this stuff if you don't actually own the game. The as this, Because apparently you can use a legacy copy and connect with CSGO. Anyway, the, now of course, they've moved the vast majority of the players over to Counter-Strike 2. But if they... My attitude is if you can still technically play CSGO with other players, then they haven't killed it. And... That's less my problem. Although, uh, I mean, I can understand where you kind of be kind of pissed, but at the same time, I can see the developer side also, where they want to update the player base to what they think is what they think is going to be better, and then they're trying to usher everyone on board. I feel like as long as you have the option to continue playing the older one, I'm not really going to fight that fight beyond that because then it's like if you really want to play the older game, you can. And that's all I'm aiming for. And past that, it's kind of like what the crowds want or what they're flocked to, you know? So, because, I mean, that happens. You know, there'll be old games that it has a small but, like, really dedicated fan base. Like that guy who reached out to me an email on Quake Wars. There's probably not a ton of people playing Quake Wars, but the ones that are, they probably really enjoy it and they can keep playing it. Well, the mission accomplished in my eyes. I mean, that's... That, that's all I'm aiming for. It's just you can continue playing games if you want to, you know. But, I mean, as far as what the market wants or what developers want, as long as you have that option, I'm pretty laissez-faire on it. So, um, but that said, I think Overwatch is an example where the 
No, I think they killed it. Like, I, to the best of my – again, I've never played Overwatch. To the best of my knowledge, no one can play Overwatch 1 now. Is that correct? We'll wait for the – so that that is a dead game, and that's the stuff I've – I think we shouldn't tolerate it on any level. So, yeah, I mean, again, nobody likes it when there's, like, big changes to a game and they kind of ruin it. But I'm not qualified enough. To, I haven't played... I have... The last time I played Counter-Strike, I think, online with people was with original Counter-Strike. So I haven't played it in a long time, so I'm not qualified to answer it beyond what carries over from the original, so... Yeah, well, somebody's saying they paid for a game before it went free to play. I feel like that's also a let the buyer beware situation, you know. It's like, yeah, that kind of sucks when that happens. But at the same time, you didn't lose anything. It's just that a whole lot of people got a free ride that you didn't. It's, but they got, But what you got was playing it sooner is generally what happens, so. But yeah, if you had known that, then you would have wanted to just wait for the free copy. I, I get that. Um, okay, so yeah, sorry if I'm not your advocate on that, but that's that's also what makes me go so hard on this, is that I'm single issue. It is just going to be stopping games from being destroyed that people have pay money for. So if... You know, I, I will fight, I think, harder than, like, any... I don't want to say anything, because I know people have gone really far in games, but any... I, I bet this could become one of the bigger, most noticeable game movements you're going to see, the dedicated ones, because I'm I'm going to go on every angle, and I've been spending months organizing this stuff, so to get it right, that, that we will have to maximize our impact. So, So sorry if I'm not... I agree it sucks, but I can also see the developer's view on that. So sorry if I'm not your your champ on that issue in particular. But if they took it away entirely, then yes, I'm on I I'm not I'm gonna be relentless. So But if you can play it, it's just a hassle. You can I, I think people can deal with that. Uh Okay. Oh yeah, it's asking. Well, it's good. Oh no. Okay, they're saying if I was. It sounds like if I was in a Half Life Two scenario and the Combine invaded, would I be willing to join the Rebels and liberate Earth, or would I just try to get by under the Combine's regime? Um, uh, it, it really depends. Like, it, it depends like how thorough the invasion is, and if like the stakes are literally the extinction of all people on Earth within your lifetime. In other words, not just like a generation away, but like, no, they're ending your life early. Because if I feel like I have nothing to lose, and yeah, of course I'm going to join it. Otherwise, if I can feel like I can live out my life and just, then I might not. Or if it's going to become like intolerable, like technically I get alive, but they're like going to like infest your body or something or like wipe your mind then uh I, I would be more involved with that but I would, I would only want like smart attacks like i wouldn't want to just do a general battle I, like it would it would be like a hundred percent guerrilla warfare and that's and that's only if it's viable like if it's just that there are no smart options then you have things limited like i mentioned the tripods and Freeman's mind, you know, in the in the tripod story, like the resistance is such a long shot that like they have no chance in a fair fight on this. So like all the resistance is just like hiding out in like remote mountains or, or something, you know, like underground, I think. Or like they maybe have like a sleeper agent that that it's just like the odds are astronomical that they would get lucky like this to have a sleeper agent that maybe they can act on that but it's really long shot so it's sometimes like if the alien i would just have to weigh it you know based on like risk versus reward and like what are the stakes what are our odds that sort of thing so 
And yes, I have seen the movie Reign of Fire. Somebody's asking about that, but I haven't. I, I, I remember some details, but I forgot others, you know. I remember the movie just kind of being okay, you know, not, it, it didn't blow, it, I feel like it could have been better given the, given the sort, given the setting, you know, post-apocalypse, dragon post-apocalypse, apocalypse. So. So I was asking if there are hidden gem, hidden gem racer games I know of. Not really. The, uh, I was saying, what do you think could be done to improve racing games today? Um, I'm probably not the most hardcore racing game to comment on that because some because usually like the hardcore people have like a list of things they want with like you know the mechanics, which cars, uh, like like how they handle damage model. For me, it's all about the environments. So they're they're asking like things they could do and improve upon racing games. Just like give us great environments it is. Some they could be imaginative for some of them, or if you are gonna have like contemporary ones, like make have them really interesting ones too. And a lot of them have been decent on that. Like I think it was, I think I heard a quote somebody had in a YouTube video. It was either for like the Gran Turismo or Forza series, where they said that like they can do kind of close to life 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 like graphics now. But th that's not actually what they're aiming for. What they're aiming for is like almost like better than real life. In other words, say it looks real, but say it's like the perfect time of day and you're going at like the perfect angle. So it just looks so gorgeous. And so they, they try to like tilt the deck so it like looks even nice. So it's not like, unrealistic exactly. It's just that like you have like the perfect conditions to make you like want to race on this track. And I'm thinking, yeah, that's an awesome philosophy to have for making a racing game. Where it's like, it's still realistic and contemporary, but it's like you're stacking the deck to make it just look the best it possibly could. Because you have experts who know how to, know exactly what they're doing with color and lighting and you know, th the angles you're coming at for different approaches and like the landscape, like what are the, nicest looking places in the world, that sort of thing. So, you know, I, I kind of get that feeling actually also, like even as a kid, like I wouldn't care about the cars, but sometimes I would love, I would like watching car ads because some of them, they would just show like these, like just the nicest places looking, the nicest looking possible places on earth. And then they would just have like, you know, first rate cinematography. It was just like a treat to watch those. Or uh, th th that's actually some of what I enjoy about uh, the Top Gear show. Or, or I, I guess oh, I'm, I'm watching old ones, but I mean, eventually I guess I'll catch up to the Grand Tour. But I, I like, because you have like really first rate cinematography sometimes in those. And to some extent, I also get that feeling from a lot of James Bond movies where, you know, I mean, James Bond will be interested in the story and the action, but Sometimes the locations, it's just like, wow, this is just gorgeous what they're showing because he's always globetrotting in those for the, as part of the plot. So, yeah, it, it's uh, – so, yeah, just don't neglect the environments. It, it doesn't have to be cutting edge, but just you need really good art direction. And, and you have that, I'm probably going to like your racing game. And you can consult other people who are racing game fanatics about it, all the other stuff because – I don't care too much if my racing's arcadey or if it's super realistic or what brand of car I'm driving or whatever. Just, just g give me nice. I I'm looking for excuses to drive it is in racing games. Is what I'm doing. So, so if you're giving me gorgeous excuses, then I'm I'm in. You know. Okay, I'm skipping more. I don't have great answers to. Okay, I'm down to almost the end. So you can type doing live chat questions. Do at Ross Broadcast. And I'll uh, try to answer a few of the live ones while I read the remainder here.
Oh, somebody is asking if AI could benefit me for the movie. Oh, yeah, AI can benefit me tons. Like the pen In fact, I have a wish list of things I want for AI. In fact, I was thinking maybe I should make that public. Okay, okay, maybe I'll... I mean, some of it's stuff that would help me with work, and some of the stuff is just things I really want. Like, it's it's almost all multimedia related, like audio, video, uh, some extent 2D, so... Okay, who drew the pictures of you and Metal Dave in the Go to Hell episode? It's in the credits, I guess. Uh, I don't, I don't, if it was really rough, then it was me. But otherwise, again, I don't remember, but it should be in the credits. Oh. Did they really draw Dave accurate or is it a random guy in a Slayer team? No, it was, I think it was pretty accurate. Like he would wear Slayer shirts a bunch. Yeah, I mean, he had long hair, except he had like a real kind of like stocky bouncer build. Like I think he was taller than me. Um more mass. I, I think he had some, yeah, he definitely had tattoos. I think he might have had some piercings too. That kind of black hair. But, uh, do you ever see yourself making an indie game or getting one published? It's not impossible, but it's not like on my trajectory of things to do, but it seems like I've done a lot of things I wasn't planning on doing, like m moving to Poland and <laughs> now le leading what I think is going to be the biggest campaign ever on trying to stop games and getting, you know, getting legislation, t attempting to pass legislation again. I was not predicting any of that, so who knows, but. Let's see. Okay, well, let's see. Are there any more questions? Or are we, but we can end it here. That's not a problem. I'll, I'll give a little bit longer just in case there's any struggle. Okay, there's one. Did you end up ever end up contacting the game preservation groups? Okay. Um, yes, I did contact some in the past years ago, but it was looking kind of hazy. My new plan now <clears throat> is, look, honestly, except maybe for Germany, because I need to figure out what the hell is going on there with how we should handle this. I th Honestly, I think we're ahead of the game as far as what we should do about this compared to the vast majority of game preservation groups, as far as where to go. And my new plan is once this is all set up and running, to reach out to them again saying, hey, we have this set up. Can you maybe get some people involved to come sign some of this or let your audience know we're doing this? So th they're going to be part of the media push from April onward. But no, I, I really think we are like ahead of the – I would be very surprised if they know more about how to handle this than we do at this point. Because we have been putting in the hours trying to find, trying to just exhaust like every option and figure out where are our dead ends. Because again, there have been a lot. So th there wouldn't be that much point at this juncture, but yeah, April and onward for sure. Uh, I'll, I'll involve anybody. And you can, uh, if you want to send leads on that, that I'll look at later. Go for it, you know? Uh, why did you delete the video from the latest interviews from Accursed Farms rather than unlist them? I know they're in the junk channel, but um, it, it, it was partially me not thinking it through and partially uh, I wanted new ones to appear in Accursed Farms junk. So th that was a one-time thing. That, that was just me not thinking it through ahead of time. So they wanted to read the comments. And to be fair, I gave notice on the comments, okay? Um, so you, you missed your shot, I'm afraid. Maybe somebody did back them up. I don't know. You, you can a ask around. Sorry about that. Uh, that's not something I plan to do. That was just me screwing up. So the, 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 that should not be happening again in the future unless I really screw up. Uh, favorite fruits. Uh, peaches, mango, berries in general, like strawberries, blueberries, raspberries, blackberries. Yeah, I guess, I guess blackberries are a bit of a mix, though, because it's real easy to get a sour blackberry. That it, it, it's like it, it's tricky getting blackberries that are ripe enough. So, so whereas you're, you have a much safer chance with something like a strawberry or 
I got nectarines. Uh, this one. Yeah, I guess those are generally my favorite, but I mean, I like fruits in general. The, or, uh, you know, oranges, tangerines, that sort of thing. The, I mean, I like the taste of those. The, the, you, you always have to like floss immediately after oranges though, because they, they just get in your teeth. Uh, cherries, like those two. Yeah, I like, like lots of fruits. Kiwi. What places in Poland did you visit? Not a lot. We basically just, well, we visited somewhere on Tromiasto, but uh, went to Katowice and also Warsaw, which is Warsaw in English. Uh, but probably the, oh yeah, we also saw like some of the dunes, I think in, yeah, yeah I think it's, in northern Poland, it's called Hell H E L. I think it's near there, and yeah, that's where I saw. That's also near there. Was where I saw that forest. Though it's like the entire bottom was covered in moss. So it was kind of surreal. I hadn't seen a forest like that before. Uh, and like probably one of the more interesting places I saw in Warsaw was um, the university li library. It, it, it's it's interesting. It, it feels like something you, from the future. Where it, it, very exotic architecture. It's like this, it's like this mix of like a Renaissance look and like future utopian look or, or something. Like it, it's cool. I, I liked it. Uh, let's see. Any advice for applying to jobs in the USA? Oh boy. Well, m my information is going to be outdated first off, but they've been applying to more than two months now. The college degree after previous internship ended. And I haven't gotten much. Yeah, that happened to a friend of mine where he, he had an engineering degree and it was just like months before he could get anything. Not sure I should consider stuff from employment agencies, though I even screwed up an opportunity there. Yeah, it sounds brutal from what I'm hearing. Like I've heard the narrative of there being a lot of jobs. It's like kind of an illusion. There was a really good video on it. I'll try and get a link to that. Um... Uh, where a lot of these are kind of like fake postings to do, to basically kind of gather uh, data from applicants to figure out like what the pool is out there or what their uh, competitors might have. It was kind of complicated, but there's also stuff where let's say there's one job, but in order to increase their chances, they're gonna advertise that job in like 20 states across the country. So there's really, so yeah, there's all these job openings, but it's really just for one. Or there was some other stuff. It, I heard this, I was thinking, geez, this sounds like hell for people applying for jobs. Uh, oh, oh yeah, the other, there was the other thing is like, sometimes they need to put the postings, but for like tax purposes or something or to, but they've really picked out who they want like internally inside the company. So it's just, I, I don't even, I lost track of all the reasoning from it, but it, it just sounds bad. I guess what I would recommend is take whatever you can grab that you don't like absolutely hate just to write things out for the time being. And then that'll take some of the pressure off you to find like your dream job, like right now, uh, especially if you're getting something part time. Oh, oops, the check got paused. Um, so, you know, then you, can, then you can be just apply to anything that you don't absolutely hate. So you don't have to like it, but it's just like, yeah, okay, I can be, you can be a clerk somewhere or you can just work at some warehouse or something for a while. And then like, you know, like a night stalker or something. And then, uh, and then while you do that, just keep applying for the jobs that you actually you want or better fit you. And then hopefully something will pan out and just don't be afraid to just kind of spam them. Oh yeah, that's the other thing. They, something that's probably worse than when I was looking for jobs or when I was younger was, uh, is they'll ask for, they'll have like rounds and rounds of interviews where it can get kind of insane. And I'm just thinking like, geez, that, and, and it's more like, I think it's, partially misguided 
company policy based on like some bad data and partially because the people they know they get at the end of that they know are going to be desperate so they're less likely to like leave and it's it just it sounds bad from what i've been hearing so but i'll definitely give a link to that video i forget the name of it but i can find it um it's worth watching but yeah it's i don't have great well i guess if you want to go to the extreme angle there's always the fellowship for potential communities where you can find some cop out or, or intentional community where they're like, okay, you're willing to work on the farm all day. Fine. Come down, come on down. <laughs> like, yeah. So yeah, there, there's always unconventional options too, you know? Uh, yeah. I guess there's like gig work, but that, that, that can probably get pretty soul draining too. Yeah. Yeah. I guess you can look in the gig work for, which is going to pay garbage, but it, it's, it'll slow the bleeding, I guess is the way, best way to look at it. But, yeah, I, I don't know. Uh, I'm probably the wrong person to ask on this because I've been spending a whole lot of my life trying not to get back into that situation. D does it, and I recognize a whole lot of that has been luck. So, though, though I, I guess the intentional community stuff, that's more within your r sphere of control. <laughs> you know, that, that's not just luck. Uh, there's a lot more influence on that, you know. Just, just say, yeah. Well, watch, watch the cult tycoon episode if you want more on that. What's a commercial jingle annoyingly stuck in your head? Okay, the double mint gum. Well, once I watched younger, jeez, uh, the, there was like a, there was like a kids toy back in the day. It was like my buddy, and like kid sisters, like the same tune that that one played a lot on TV. Uh, what are some others? Oh, uh, I think I think I've thankfully managed to purge a lot of them. I still have the call music from when I worked for Bell South on the phone. The hold music that, that's stuck in my head. That's just like easy listening music, though. It's not a. Oh man, that's a good question. I I, I could probably remember more, but those are the ones that come to mind immediately. Um. Uh, Oh, well, there's the the old Coca-Cola one. Yeah, you know, I'd like to teach the world to sing. Now, there's a quality one that well, I never saw this on TV, but I saw it after the fact. It's a, a Wendy's training video rap. I'll, I'll write that one down. That, that one's good. I like that one. I'll, I'll give a link to that in on YouTube. Uh, okay, I'll, I'll move the chat down just to move it back up in a second. What are some other ones that are just are just stuck in my head? Um, yeah, I, I guess I've been lucky enough to purge. I feel like there's some good ones out there. I, I'm forgetting too, though, because they don't, they don't have to be bad, uh, you, you know. But even though a lot of them are, even though a lot of them are just annoying and just get in your head. Uh, Yeah, I guess I'm drawing a blank on the others. So, again, it's not the you're saying I look okay. Thankfully, I don't know a lot of these. I, I my my parents cut off my access to cable TV relatively early, and, and when I was younger, so I only got like a certain exposure of that. And after that, that they got kind of cut out. So, like I think it was like around eight or nine that they decided, okay, that's it. We're just cutting cable, save money. Yeah. Uh, okay, so let me catch up with a few more questions and I'll wind this up and just find my spot. Phantasmagoria 2 is amazing. What are your thoughts of Phantasmagoria? I thought it was pretty good, but I mean, 2 blew me away. So I, I, I like 1. It's just... I play them in the reverse order too, though, so that that's part of the problem. But I, I still think two hits way. The, the themes and hits it hits in the story. I, I think it's just way more engrossing. So yeah, I'm, I'm, I'll reach out to 
he'll be a limited audience, but I, I hope to have another appearance on um, Paul Morgan Stetler's YouTube channel. I'll definitely mention the the campaign on that. So and can maybe pick up some signatures. You've been doing this. Oh yeah. Uh, Are there people around you who speak English? Man, I've been kind of cut off. Maybe a few, but I've been kind of cut off lately. Uh, but yeah, there's there's some, but uh, it's nothing I can really rely on. Didn't see anyone credit in the sketch. Okay, so if the picture looks really good, it probably wasn't me. If it looks like, yeah, maybe a middle schooler drew this, then it might be me, you know. What's an actor you always enjoy seeing cameoed? I think I kind of mentioned this last time, but like, I don't know if there's any I enjoy seeing cameo. Though I'd say, for the cameo, one that comes to mind, for the cameos I have seen them in, Brad Pitt tends to have pretty good choice. Yeah, he, he tends to have pretty good cameos. I, I remember from. Uh, I'm trying to think. What are some other ones with yeah you know, well Matt Damon's similar but okay what, what are other cameos I like well again I mentioned Christopher Walken past and Willem Dafoe uh oh, oh well I don't know if I've seen him in a cameo but I, w I would certainly like it uh Gary Busey you know he's let's see what are some other ones or, or, or okay I don't know if it's his son but there's another one of the Buseys or has, that I like too. It's has similar presence. I forget his name. Uh, are your final videos uploaded as AVIs or MP4s? Uh, neither MKVs. But that, that's it's very similar to MP4. It's just a container. I, I could convert it to MP4 with not much trouble. Do you, do you ever think about alternate timelines? Like what could have been like if you became a cop instead of film scheme it's on YouTube, yeah, to some extent, and that'll come up in a future video. Jobs question: I have biology, ecology, bachelor's. Any perspective? Yeah, well, you can do one of my hell jobs I've had in the past, and yeah, if summer's coming up in a few months. I worked for the entomology department for a while for Virginia Tech. And just you're just going out in the forest laying bug traps. I mean, maybe they're still doing something like that. Uh, you, you might be able to find something around a university that you can pick up. Um, biology, ecology, bachelors. Yeah, just I guess try and get in some touch with some nature groups. See if there's any. Maybe you can pick up some contacts that way, or um, you know, but people who are like outdoors a lot, so they might know somebody who knows somebody who needs. Work done. I mean, f farming is de you're def definitely going to have some crossover between that ecology. So you might be able to find some farmhand jobs out there. Or, let's see. Okay. What do you think is going to happen to other people regarding the silencing of Boeing when a whistleblower was found dead? Yeah. Are they going to be able to? Sorry, I don't have my glasses on. It just set the chat too far away from me. Are they going to be able to drag the drag them to court? That's a that's a really bad precedent. I mean, my understanding is we've been cracking down on whistleblowers, not killing them, but basically leaving them out in the cold, for, like for a while now. I think that. I think that started under, well, uh, well, actually, I say started. It probably goes back a while, but like, yeah, maybe I think I remember hearing about it more like fifteen years ago, or something like that. And it's just it hasn't gotten better. I, I mean, that, that's what something like Snowden is, you know. It's it like Snowden's made it very clear he would intend to come back to the country if he thought he'd get a fair trial, but. He's not thinking he can get a fair trial, and I imagine he's probably accurate. So, yeah, I mean that's, I mean that that's like mafia level stuff, you know. Wipe, 
you know, wiping out the the witness, you know. So, I mean, I guess it's not proven that it was murder, but it, uh, well, I, I should probably shouldn't get into too many details to not screw up the YouTube algorithm, but it, it's, it seems quite suspicious. I, I mean, that, that's all I'll say. Uh, again, I only heard just bits and pieces, but yeah, I, I think that will have a chilling effect. The, the only people it won't on are the people who just don't care. Like, like they, they don't, they'll, they'll accept all the, the risk and just do it. But th those kinds of people are kind of rare. So, oh, they're watching a Mystery Science Theater 2000 Forever-a-thon on YouTube. Wondering if the post credits. Uh, having funny clips in Game Dungeon episodes were inspired by MST3K. Actually, probably not. It goes back older than that. Uh, well, well, the one, some comedy movies would have them, but like the, a famous one I can think of is the movie Airplane, and that's from the 70s. So I, I'm pretty sure I picked it up from just various movies where sometimes they have a kicker. Yeah, I guess people say post credits now. I, I always heard them referred to as the kicker. Uh, yeah, did, didn't Mel Brooks have some movies like that too? Where, where he has like some po post credits gags? Anyway, I, I always liked it, you know, because you, you never know what's coming at the end. So, I, actually, I think Mystery Science Theater 3000, maybe the later ones did. For the most part, I think they didn't. Because what I remember from the end of Mystery Science Theater 3000 is. You know, you, you have the view of the planet and then the theme song's playing while the credits roll up. So, I mean, they usually have like an after talk before that, but. Yeah, yeah, they always ended that like on the, well, a lot of the older ones ended it on a pretty good note. They'd be like, okay, push the button, Frank, and then, and then we go out. I thought that was a great way to end it, so. My learning Polish is getting derailed because of this damn game campaign, but I was hoping to be underway more by now, but I'm going to get on it this year, like, more significantly. So. so do you admire people like Snowden, Greta Thunberg, and others who speak truth to power, and what do you think of others placing you there with your campaign? Uh, this is, you're, you're asking a 10-minute question in just a short amount of time. Um, well, one, I'm not on that level, okay, at, even close, okay? I mean, like, like compared to Snowden, for Greta Thunberg, I've heard conflicting reports where, see, okay, I'm not, okay, for the record, I'm not accusing her of this in any level because I don't know enough. But I will say among the space of people talking about global warming, there there is a certain industry interest of having people who are proposing what I'm calling non-solutions, or, or I think it's referred to as greenwashing sometimes, where they propose things that sound like a solution, but when you consider the scale of the problem, they're not at all. And like only really drastic action or like radical action gets us even close. And I've heard, I've heard, I'm not willing to substantiate this or re I haven't done the research, so I'm not accusing it, but I have heard commentary like that about Greta Thunberg, that like she's maybe being manipulated in, the, in that way. Because like for, but, I mean, not, not, not all of them. Like, I think ones that, I think they're probably ineffective, but I've heard ones that aren't taking that approach. Or I think I've heard of, like, Extinction Rebellion might be one, where they're kind of realizing that only drastic action would happen. That was actually one of the things I respected about uh, Yukowski when I talked to him, was that, like, I mean, I don't subscribe to his views, but if you accept them as true... His, what he was saying needs to be done, like you basically need to just shut down this all immediately and just like have this like considered a national emergency. If you believe that, then that's consistent with, you know, what that belief. 
that, you know, okay, like I don't believe that, but if I did believe that, then this sounds logical to me. So it's like, I respected that about what he was saying there. So I feel like global warming, it's a similar thing that like, if we're just nibbling on the edges, then I don't know. But again, I'm, I'm under-informed on Greta Thunberg. For Snowden, everything I know, yes, lines up with that, that like, yeah, he, he really took one for the team on that and exposing what he did. I mean, and exposing what, you, you know, exposing the material that he did. And it could have ended a lot worse for him. And there are other people like that, but man, we're, again, we're leaving whistle, at best, we're, le we're leaving whistleblowers out to dry. And at worst, we're having stuff like Boeing or else imprisoning them. So, uh, you know, that's not good, but yeah. And don't, I would not compare them any, listen, let's make this really clear. As much as I care about games, I consider what I'm doing hobbyist activism. All right. That this is not, nobody's dying from the games being shut down or, you know, getting people sick or, you know, there are far, far more serious issues of what I'm doing. So don't, don't try to like put me on the same level. I mean, okay. I guess in terms of seriousness, there's like a little bit of crossover with something like Snowden, but he hit the stakes for him were just like a thousand times what I have. I don't really, my only stakes are just time. So, you know, it's, because unfortunately Snowden's exposed all this stuff, but it hasn't really made much of a difference as I, best I can tell, but he was certainly doing the right thing. So, uh, yeah, that, that, that's, that's kind of why I skipped over this question because I'm thinking, well, I don't know the most about this and I don't want to like have false accusations or anything, but th that's something to be aware of. Like, for example, everyone switching to solar panels or like wind, that does not solve global warming in the slightest. I mean, it, 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 re it reduces some of the additional damage. Like again, slows the bleeding a little bit, but even that gets a little hazy. It's like the only like actual solutions. Well, I should, uh, well, uh, okay, well, this is getting long complicated for like an end of the chat question, but the, 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 the main significant things I'm aware of to reduce the damage in a significant way is just basically reducing our resource use significantly. And that's not an answer that business and the powers that be are prepared to take. So we're, we're stuck in this kind of dystopian track. The only thing I know of that will like really reduce it. Well, there's, I think there's like only two options and one of them might not even be an option. One is having like biological carbon capture on just an utterly, utterly massive scale. Like, and, and not, not these machines that they're making. Those are just, I think those are a diversion, honestly. Uh, but like, I think like algae, certain kinds of algae can capture. So what you do is you put out the algae, you grow as much as you can, and then you put it in a state where it's preserved and you just leave it so it can't like degas off. And you just do that on such an utterly massive scale that if you're doing it year after year, de decade after decade, we can maybe rein it back in. And the other, like I mentioned, Conquest Earth is blot out the sun. However, that one is way if, th that one would work. However, that one gets way more dangerous depending on what we're using to block out the sun. For the record, I am against using sulfur dioxide to use it, we, or yeah, sulfur dioxide. Like we need stuff that's not going to turn into acid rain all over the globe. So, like, it, it's like we really, and, and if, it's not that smaller measures can't help, but like, like again, we've mentioned with solar panels, like let's say that reduces the use, but then we're doing all sorts of strip mining activity to do it. And that's increasing other kinds of pollution. It's like, well, is that, I mean, it's kind of like training one devil for another, you know, or 
maybe less. I mean, not to say, okay, I should wrap it up. Not to say that there's not, uh, what, good options. It's just that at the scale we need, it's like, I guess there's, a, yeah, I guess that's another thing that happens is you have minor things being framed as uh, real s total solutions. Whereas you're talking about something that might help like one tenth of 1%. And that's fine to do that. But if that's not accompany accompanied with the stuff that makes a huge difference, then it's just, there's almost no point. And I, I feel like that gets kind of weaponized by bad actors in this. So, yeah, sorry, that kind of went off on a tangent, but since you mentioned it, yeah, one, don't hold me up, don't treat me like I'm, like a, a serious act. I'm not gonna get imprisoned for this, okay? You know, I'm not, like, it, it's, I don't think, honestly, I think the worst thing that's going to happen is just a bunch of mean comments. So it's like, yeah, I can handle that. Uh, I mean, so, I mean, for me personally, you, you know, so it's like that, that's not, that's not putting anything on the line really, except from just taking a lot of time out from the other stuff I should be doing. So I think it's great that we do have people standing up to do the real thing, but we're not making it easy for them. Okay, is there anything lighter to talk about before I end this? Consumer protections are still pretty important. Maybe not that important, but still important. I will agree there that there is a chance that, well, I'll kind of mention this in the later video, but there is a chance that we're kind of influencing things from cascading in a worse direction as far as like consumer rights. I, I'm not saying that for sure that's what it is, but there's a chance because games and maybe printers are just almost like ground zero for how much crap can we get away with doing to the customer? You know, like, except for stuff, the only way it gets worse for having less rights on games is if it physically, if, if the product physically harmed you, you know? <laughs> so games don't really have that, but anything less, it's like they're ground zero. So we, we can almost, one theory I have is it's possible games could be sort of like a laboratory for businesses to see like, oh, what are customers, what will they really accept if we like int roll it out slowly, you know? So, and that could, that could span into all kinds of things. So, enemy, enemy, any enemies and shooters you think are overused? Uh, maybe not overused. I don't really like the really fast and small ones. <laughs> <laughs> enemies, you know. Which pierogi filling is your favorite? Uh, for, I, I guess, I forgot the name of it, but I think it's like a combination of like onions and mushrooms and maybe cabbage. Or... Okay, that, that's a good place to end it. I'm getting hungry. So thanks for showing up. Show up again in April. <laughs> okay, I'll, I'll see you.